Go. All right. So welcome to our 22nd software meeting in sunny Leeds. Um, so we have a... Uh, uh, we are recording the session and please put yourself on mute if you're not talking. Um, we have a quite large agenda. I think uh, it's somewhere over here. Uh, so, uh, in the two parts, really, uh, first of all, sort of an update on where we are with the software, but then a summary of our uh, first hackathon that we had, and then what has happened since then. And so, the uh, four topics that were tackled at the hackathon are listed there. And uh, then we have some discussions on GPU support, and we have uh, some extra people in the room and online for uh, educating on this, uh, us on this, I'm sorry. And so because of that, I think uh, most of the people we all know, but some of them we don't. So it would be useful if we quickly go around the room. Uh, and I think I'll start with myself. Should I uh, record names or? Yeah, if you don't mind, yes. Yeah. Um, you can, I mean, it's going to be hard, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll add ourselves on later on. So, uh, obviously, I'm Chris, so uh, next month. <laughs> so, my name is Philippe from STFC. Yeah. So Philippe Gombron. So. Yeah. Uh, uh, can you just give a bit on your background as well? Because uh, most people haven't. Okay, uh, so I, I'm a physicist and at FCFC, STFC I've been doing mostly things like uh, high performance computing but for applied to a CFD or numerical analysis or bioinformatics. Okay. And now I'm, I'm supposed to play with GPUs. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so which thing are you involved in? Which? Oh, it's, so it's the, the high performance software engineering group, part of the Hard Tree Center. Yeah. Thank you. I'm, I'm Patek Patwa, I'm from the University of Leeds and in Micro, and I work on the same detect which metries for PET scan. Daniel Deita, Leeds University, and I'm working on PET image construction. I'm Adam Roxy, a PhD student from the University of Manchester, uh, same PET image construction. Evan was it? Uh, Harry Tsukos from the University of Leeds and I'm also working on the same topic. Uh, Martin Turner, part of the University of Manchester, but uh, coming in from the CCPI. I'm Mercy from the University of Leeds, I'm working on spilling correction. Um, Ashley Gilman, quickly type that down. Uh, a, um, a student from uh, Brisbane, Australia, with CSIRO and UQ, um, and in the UK at the moment for exchange with CCP, just finishing uh, six weeks, oh, eight weeks, including Leeds as well. Hi, uh, I'm Richard. Um, I'm a postdoc at UCL, working with Chris, <coughs> and my project is on a um, uh, really synergistic. Uh, Reconstruction, so it's all the heart of this project. Uh, Evgeny Achinikov, a software developer and a CC PETMR project manager. Thank you. So, shall we, for people online, go in order as you appear in the participant list, which might be the same as for everybody? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, starting with Eduardo. Oh, Eduardo Pasca from SCFC. Stephen from SCFC, and part of the Software Outlook project. Yeah. So you're going to hear from Sue and uh, and Philip more later on as well. Yes. Uh, and why why we have invited them particularly is because of the GPU item on the agenda over there. Thank you. Uh, Johannes. Hello, I'm Johannes, and um, I'm from Berlin, and I'm a PhD student here doing PetMR and mainly motion compensation. So, okay. Could you understand that? Because I think I'm not in the best room. It's okay. Good, thanks. 
You are in a cave. You're not in a room. Casper? <laughs> uh, Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, cool. Uh, yeah, I'm Casper de Costa Lewis, PhD student at King's, uh, supervised by Andrew Reeder, and I do pets reconstruction and post processing. Uh, MR guided as well. Lots of GPU stuff and machine learning. Yep. Thank you, uh, yeah, Andrew Reader, King's College London. Um, so yeah, work in reconstruction and uh, increasing levels of interest in machine learning like everybody else. Yeah, thank you. Uh, that seems to be it at the moment. I, there might be some other people joining later on, but uh, well, they'll just have to send an email then to tell us that they were there. Um, so uh, with that, I think it uh, gives you sort of an overview that we are from a bit everywhere in the UK and even uh, down under, so uh, it's all great uh, with everybody interested in the mark, really. So uh, I thought we would start with a brief update on the, what things we have been doing on the software uh, on Surf and Surf Reg, Surf that has been accepted and then uh, Surf Reg not yet, it's not yet merged. And then later on, you will also hear about things that are under development. So, but uh, let's just do whatever is being uh, in in the current state of serve. So, let's start with Evgeny. Do you have any slides, or you want to share, or you just talk? It's just one slide. I might as well read it. Probably we should have it on screen. Okay. Is it so, on the so, one drive? Ah, or? wait. I, I haven't started. <laughs> so, I, I'll, I'll better read this in the time. Okay. So, uh, not much happened since last meeting, this being summer, you know, and uh, myself, I was away for a total of three weeks on holidays, and Chris was away too for two weeks. Right? So, the main thing, main new thing is a uh, namespace surf uh, in our C++ code, uh, which unfortunately broke backward compatibility, so we had to move. Now, now we are heading for release 2.0 rather than 1.2 as planned. Um, uh, another substantial thing is um, I, uh, during hackathon I noticed that MR images are unsorted with respect to Z coordinate. Um, it puzzled me previously why when looking at, at certain images I, I would have it twice. It turned out that they were interleaved, or even an odd um, uh, images interleaved. Anyway, so I, I sorted that out. Um, also, I implemented element-wise multiplication and division for um, images and uh, acquisitions, um, uh, so that now in, in Python script you, you can use uh, the usual star and uh, notation for element-wise multiplication of images and acquisition. Again, again, that uh, issue was raised at Hackathon with another positive <laughs> outcome. All right. And in MATLAB, of course, you use dot star and dot division. Um, uh, various uh, little things like default constructor and setup uh, for an acquisition model object, and lots of small changes and bug fixes. That's it, basically. Nothing major. We're talking about master branch now. On, on, on self-rich, uh, nothing's done. And also on branches which were created during hackathon. Although I, I believe most of them are on stir. Right? Yeah, yeah. I, I guess we'll, we'll hear more about that in a second. Yeah, so it's all it's all good. So we, we're not really going to go through our uh, list of issues and, and plan and uh, so on for the future this time because we then we well, then we will run out of that. So, uh, but uh, it's all available. Go and have a look at uh, your leisure. So Richard, do you want to update this on the surf rich? Yeah, so for, for those who don't know, there's another branch, that was the master branch on surf. Um, and there's also another branch which I've created called surf reg, which um, is sort of a wrapper around nifty reg, which is used for resampling, used for image registration. Um, and it also has some functionality, <coughs> some original functionality of itself. And so then we're hoping to, to get that incorporated into SURF so that in SURF you can do some pet reconstruction, you can do some MR reconstruction, and you can also do registration and resampling, and that'll help you move between the two spaces, as well as whatever use you might want for it. Um, so that's where we're up to. 
and we're hoping to get that. And currently we can go from a stir pet image into a surf reg image. <coughs> we hope that soon, one day soon, we'll be able to also be able to go from an MR image into the surf image. And once we can do that, then we can flip between the two fairly easily. And that will really help with synergistic reconstructions, which is, you know, sort of what surf is, is about. That's where we're up to. And, and recently I put in the namespace, namespace surf. <coughs> so it's sort of aligned with, uh, with, with how surf is at the moment. All right. Any questions? Yeah, Harry. Uh, I find the name a little bit bizarre. Uh, yeah, so um, I'm not sold to it, and we're going to have a, like a review meeting in a couple of weeks and, and figure out all the names and all that sort of stuff. So I think the names, yeah, it can, it, it's, it's surfs wrap around Nifty Reg, but then that sort of gets quite long going on as well. So, <coughs> the idea being that um, surf will have pet reconstruction, which currently is surf, but could be something else. So we want some sort of registration resampling, which at the moment is Nifty Reg, but could be something else. So that's why I went for a generic name which didn't necessarily include the word nifty reg because it won't, in the future it won't necessarily be tied to that. And so the fact that the surf at the moment are starts for reconstruction? Uh, no, it's for registration. <laughs> we can make it. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> you could use it for registration or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a good point, uh, but then I don't think we'll ever, I don't know. Also, once the branch is merged, that name will disappear, because yeah. it will just be surf, okay. which has a registration component in it. So it's for release 2 point something. Yeah, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> well, it won't be before then, that's for sure. <laughs> what, what if you wanted to have a nifty reg for, for resampling and an, an ITK uh, wrapper as well for resampling? If you want an ITK image and a nifty reg image? So that's when it gets slightly tricky because I've been dealing with nifty reg. I've been using nifty images, but you wouldn't necessarily, if you're using some different resampling or registration tool, have to go by that method. But I mean, you, I'm just saying you potentially could have a whole different system. It wouldn't have to share the functionality. It would have to be separately implemented that could do the conversion as well. I think you probably would want to share functionality and use as many virtual functions as possible so that <laughs> it's sort of um, the user is, is sort of, uh, They'll say, I want you to do this using Nifty, or I want you to do this using ITK or anything else, and it'll, it'll sort of go into itself. Mm -hmm. But then how, how much you can do that in reality, I don't know. At the moment, and probably for the foreseeable future, it's, it's, it's just Nifty Reg, so that's, yeah. that's what we're up to. Yeah. I've just asked, because I've got a slide in mind about uh, the image hierarchy, um, which we'll get mm. to soon, I guess. But um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that, it is. It could be a good topic for our next uh, software meeting on, on trying to understand uh, having different engines, we call it, and how do we actually make sure that the code on top of it doesn't know how do we implement that in practice. There's uh, also some interest of getting another pet reconstruction package in, integrated and so on. And so on. Maybe we sort of always said we would do it, but we've never really thought how we would do it. So. Going to be a somewhat difficult discussion. Um, okay, uh, so let's go to uh, hackathon issues then. Um, right, I'm using the end. Anyway, I don't think I need to show the agenda again. Oh no, survey. The user survey. Survey, yeah. So I think I it's uh, Eduardo. Do I have to stop sharing or you can? Stop? Yeah, maybe I just can share my screen if I manage. Okay, so we put together a um, questionnaire for, uh, for the users, so potential users, to understand what is their main interest and also what type of platforms they're interested in so that we can then focus a little bit more on in our development, uh, especially thinking about supporting multiple OSs and different architectures. So that would be the idea. Uh, so this Google already gives you kind of um, um, 
analyzed uh, responses. Uh, I have to say that these are just analyzed question by question. So maybe some, it would be interesting also to follow how a single user or a group of users uh, decided to, to put the things. So uh, uh, most of the people have interest, uh, well, more interest in Petema, uh, but I guess uh, more people are interested in two or the three things separately. There might be some uh, person who sneaked in and said Kakti. Um, most of the users are a bit of both, so they are not purely developer nor just users. So, and there is one advisor who is out of touch with latest packages. Uh, I have to apologize with Andrew. I thought he was here. Him. <laughs> Um, uh, most of the people have interest uh, in language binding other than Python. Well, some people have uh, interest in um, binding also in C++, which is interesting. And we, it wasn't expected, uh, at least at the beginning. Uh, and for David, uh, Python seems to be winning over MATLAB. <laughs> Those percentages don't make sense. Well, uh, no, they do make sense because the it's it's not multi-response. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So you allow people to say you are interested in the three of them, say or whatever. So they don't add up to a hundred. Yes. Uh, so m s most people are likely to install it on a um, on a desktop. Many on a laptop, and there is some interest in using a cluster. I don't think I added other in this, so maybe this is a biased question. Linux is a win, but of course uh, some IN workstation work with the Windows, so it seems that Windows is still a, a requirement that we want to take uh, into account. And there are some people who don't care, actually, they, as long as the software works, they uh, be happy to embrace that operating system. Um, Ubuntu is uh, it's the best one, of course, uh, people like it. Uh, yes, yet there are people who don't care as long as the software works, which is also very nice. Um, so the journalism, so we're going to discuss about GPUs later. Uh, and there is interest in GPU as a term, I guess, because we still don't know what are the implications of going through GPU uh, path. But multi-threading CPU seems to be uh, interesting as well, right? There is very little interest in, uh, I think, in installing on a cluster using MPI, for instance, which would allow a different type of parallelism so you need more computers than one, basically. Um, I would not implement myself yet. Um, yeah, so there are many uh, people see that they work with Macs and Windows. They would like to have a package manager from within Windows and Mac. So it just gets the package, double click, and it gets installed. Uh, but the virtual machine is still quite popular, uh, and uh, this, uh, yeah, we can, we can, we should break down this a little better because these are just replies to a single question. Um, so, six, six users are using it. Uh, six or uh, eight, they will do it. They are very uh, motivated, and eight, they will look into it. And then, and then there are some other collaborating people using it. I mean, uh, yeah, basically, I think we wanted to understand uh, if we had to go the Windows way uh, and if we want to go uh, GPU or multi threading CPU. So there are some informations here. But we, I think 
it would be interesting to break it down to, at type of user level, not uh, question by question level. Uh, thank you. Uh, so it's, I, I find it uh, quite a success that we have 26 respondents in about four days. That's good. The uh, question is we will get more. Uh, I hope so. Um, so, and, and I think what's, what's happening at the moment anyway, it's too early to make any conclusions, but from what I see from this is that the uh, landscape is quite heterogeneous. And so our initial approach of saying we'll support everything seems to be what people want. And that's obviously a problem <laughs> because it eats time. Uh, but if, if that's what our user survey says in the end, I mean, not, not yet, yes, but that's what we have to do, then we have to sort of bear the consequences, I suppose. Um, which in a way is re reassuring because it means we've spent a lot of effort on something to form the basis for multi-platform, multi-language, whatever that is actually desired by the community. Otherwise, it maybe very good would have said, I'm happy with Python and Ubuntu if they waste the time. So we didn't. So that's good. <laughs> Positive message on the survey. Uh, any other observations on the survey at the moment? Uh, so I believe I set it going until end of October. Okay. Yeah, so the survey runs until the 14th of October. Okay, yeah. And, uh, well, I mean, it's, it's just the date that you, you've written in the email. Um, yeah. The other thing yeah. I wanted to comment is that uh, supporting multiple features or multiple targets helped help me. For instance, when I tried to, to build the Conda, I'm still fighting with it. I fixed a few other bugs that were hidden from... I mean, I, I didn't notice, for instance, in the standard virtual machine. I think yeah. it's useful to to have this type of problems because then you, you tend to reach a better solution. Yeah, I, I think that, that it's true and that is always also my experience in STIR that by running it on another platform, you find, you find mistakes and you find memory bugs and, and all of that stuff, which originally you think you were, they were impaired. Uh, if, if it's a time efficient way of finding bugs is another story, but at least you find them. So, uh, okay, good. So, um, so one other comment yep. too, it's probably worth sending a reminder out after a week or something for sure. people like me who are on leave and still haven't done it before we get as soon as we get it. Sure. Um, yeah, I, I suppose maybe halfway through and then one near the end or so. Mm -hmm. I didn't want, I mean, I mean, in principle, we can leave this open until MIC or something like that, but then on the other hand, people don't do it in a month, then who's going to do it afterwards? So, uh, okay. Yeah, just to comment on Ash's uh, comment, is like when we did uh, the survey for the PSMR school, there was an immediate response uh, after the initial email and then nothing else. So, as long as you poke people, then they might just reply. So it's a good idea to, yeah, to set a deadline and, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah at least before the deadline, just in case, uh, in case yeah. I forget. It is a valid comment <laughs> about MIC though. You'll have a captive audience where you'll be giving a score and you can, you know, do it. it's a small advert oh, for it. It's true, it, it's true, uh, but that's after a month. Sure. That's quite a long one. You just run a separate one. Yeah. Second survey. Mm. And it'd probably be all for like prospective users at that point. Yeah. But it would be a useful bunch of people to us. Well, at, at any rate, Google Forms do uh, save the timestamp of the vote. All right. You don't save the username uh, unless we want. But so, I mean, you can filter out uh, people who have uh, voted before a certain date, so we could leave it open anyway. It's best to close it down in a few weeks. Back to your proposal, think about future plants next year's time, it's having another one in next yeah. summer that means you can say how things have changed, right. and see how the community's grown, how the usage has changed, and that may help you. Yeah, 
Oh, I think there's Have another one for for June time. Yeah, let's do that. That's that's fine. I mean, yeah, twenty six is not bad. So if you get fifty or so, it would be great. Uh, so if you would mind adding an action point for me to send the reminder. Mm -hmm. uh, good. So let's uh, move on to the hackathon then. Um, so if if yeah, remind your colleagues to fill in the survey. Uh, they don't get the prize. But, uh, right. So, but well, did you have some kind of overview on the hackathon to get this going on that? Um, sorry, I don't have an overview. I didn't prepare an overview of the hackathon itself. Uh, so you can, I can say something and then you chip in when you want to come to it. Uh, so we had a hackathon at the end of July uh, here at RAL. It was a two-day hackathon. Um, I think we were about 12, 15, something like that. Um, and uh, we split in three, three main areas, uh, one of which was uh, new algorithm development uh, about uh, geometry and then there was one about scatter correction if I don't remember yeah so uh, well I mean I, I will comment on the algorithm development because it's the one I worked at it was really good as maybe already uh, kind of said uh, things popped up uh, things that we didn't expect or um, yes yeah, so we were forced to to see it from uh, you know a user perspective make things work better and yeah so it, it was very positive I'm not sure how much of the hackathon has already gone into the surf uh, repository but uh, I think it's been positive in in this way yeah, so uh, the, uh, the main actual implementation of a, of a different algorithm was by Matthias Erhardt, uh, Cambridge, who's implemented an algorithm using randomized subsets, ID, uh, stochastic something subsets, which is something that the, I think this paper is out now. Uh, so it's a convergent algorithm for subsets and much, much faster. What existed before, um, and it, yeah, he, he did that in a day, but based on existing code that he had already, obviously. Um, he got it to work at the end. He sort of showed one image and said, "Yes, it works." I I can show it. Yeah. Um, the in the end, so we, we had some discussion. Uh, you you noticed. Maybe uh, this is via the common, common imaging library, so that's the CCPI work. So what we what we did is to make sure that uh, the CCPI and CCP PetMR code sort of on the Python side looks the same. So it didn't really matter in which one of the two he was going to implement it, but it was easier for him. He could use some of the things that were already in CIL that are not in CERF, and that. Uh, is very positive, I think. So we had then a, a question, well, if he commits this algorithm, uh, do we put it on, in, in, in the SIL or in the SURF library? And that's maybe more of a political question than a, than a practical question. And uh, I've sent an email on that to our uh, executive committee, but I haven't had any answer yet, and I didn't bother anyone during the holiday. Uh, but so that's it's essentially there. That algorithm exists. It's implemented uh, um, uh, with some modification that has to be done. Yeah. We want to. But you said most of what I was going to say. But, uh, so I'm sorry, I thought you were finished already. So I thought I was. Uh, no, no, no. Sorry, that was for the overview. Okay. <laughs> All right. I can show you a little thing on on the algorithm uh, exactly. So, uh, yeah, so it, the group was me and Matthias is now in Bath and he was from Cambridge. Uh, so the idea is to exploit mutual uh, uh, code 
uh, happens to be in, in the two uh, CCPs uh, because they both uh, with image construction. Uh, yeah, so we wanted to exploit the CCP construction framework, which is, I have to say, rather young, so it's, it can be uh, changed according to different usage that we didn't think at the time of the design and initial development. Um, so this uh, framework is pure Python, so that already limits uh, the use of uh, base, so TV doesn't solve it. Um, it uses NumPy and C++ libraries, uh, so basically the algorithms are written in Python and then objects uh, in C++ and do things very quickly. Um, we, at some point, we decided to have a naming convention which was identical. It's almost identical because the, we have acquisition data, image data, and other things, but we don't have, for instance, acquisition model, but we have a generic uh, type, which is a data processor, uh, for instance. Um, let's see, and we defined well, we created an optimization package which is totally independent from the bits of, uh, that are related to tomography. So basically, this uh, optimization package doesn't want to know anything about acquisition data or image data or acquisition models. It just deals with functions and operators and contains algorithms. Now, algorithms are functions that do operate on functions and operators. Uh, sorry, these algorithms are Python functions, not these objects. Uh, and currently, we didn't bother adding the definition of an objective function, but the objective function will be basically made out of functions. Uh, because some algorithms do require special, uh, um, say, um, objective functions we didn't we thought it would be a more complicated to start creating a generic thing and then unpack it into the algorithm so we uh, we used it we made it this way for say to make it quick uh, so now we just need to be make sure basically that our optimization package which which works with functions can operate or and, and operators and can do the things with the surf type of objects. So the operator would be basically the acquisition model. So we need the acquisition model to have the methods that we uh, we have in the operator. And basically, functions need to be able to operate on acquisition data or image data or data containers. That's basically the, what we had to, to do. So we had to add to surf a number of uh, methods to, uh, to its objects so that they would behave as the optimization package thinks they should behave. So here is just you know a simple example. A function has you see many uh, has this number of uh, methods. This is the, the base function. Uh, so it has a great grant or props gradient. Uh, it has the weight. Itself. And then you have things. This, thanks to the hackathon, we discovered that we could do things a little better. So um, I added these two methods, which call in this one for the, the old implementation. But uh, this should be a little bit more memory efficient, say. Um, here is a, a type of function, so say a, a norms two square. Uh, and this is a type of implementation. So basically, we need to be able uh, to function need to be able to operate on uh, X and B. X and B would be, say, acquisition data. Uh, so that's at the end they return the number. Uh, okay. So uh, because we Python is black type. So it doesn't care if you pass an operator or an acquisition model as long as it has the proper uh, methods. But this is what an operator looks like. 
Uh, I don't like Python and David, I have to say, because of this. It's not tight and it's very complicated, but it's very simple in, in, this, in fact that as long as you have the right methods, it will work. So this is a acquisition model from Surf Stir. Uh, and yeah, we had to uh, add the, this direct and a joint. Uh, I think there is uh, a misalignment here. The text. Um, anyway, so this is what we had to do basically. We had to add to, uh, because that was the, was the idea to add to, uh, to surf methods so that they would behave in the CAA optimization package. Um, actually, there was a discussion with Chris. The CIA, uh, in the CIL, we wrap our objects in things to be used in the um, in the optimization so in the operators and and functions but I mean that was the decision we took at the hackathon oh no what did I do so anyway so this is the algorithm that um, Matthias had developed it's uh, called stochastic primal dual hybrid gradient algorithm here you can see a citation uh, and there are two files. I'm sorry, I just didn't uh, set up the slide. Well. Um, so th there are two files basically that are uh, used. So this one contains the algorithm, and this one contains the uh, example. This example is based on the reconstruction interactive example. So it takes the same data. I'm not sure. And this is the reconstruction I. Uh, I, we made we made it then, and we, I made it today. So it it seems to be working. Um, and I'm I'm really not sure how this compares with the the other uh, reconstructions. But this is um, only ten iteration. That's what I can say. Um, so this is the thing. Where does it belong? Uh, does it belong to SEF or does it belong to the CAL? Uh, yes, so Chris already uh, put on the table some uh, considerations. Uh, I myself would be uh, interested in putting it. Uh, I would think it would belong better to the CAL. As a matter of fact, I added the relevant CIL uh, packages to the super build. Um, so, so that we can also add to, so this algorithm itself, it's now uh, not using some regularization, which uh, it's developed in the CIL and Matthias was eager to, to use it. So I added uh, to the super build, the regularization and the optimization package basically. So I think, I think all in all, it's, it's a good idea to put it in the CIL rather than in SEF. But it's a matter of discussion, of course. Yeah, I, I don't think it's a discussion we're going to have now. Uh, no, definitely it should be CIL because it's in Python and our SEF ideology is to do everything in C++. Uh, let's <laughs> not discuss it now because in the, <laughs> it's, uh, it's a half an hour discussion, I think. So, uh, yeah, we have come Contributions that are necessarily, not necessarily in all languages and whatever, uh, going to leave us too long. Uh, we want to spend the time on GPU today. So, uh, uh, Chris, before we go forward, further, this is the output of the, um, the example, interactive re reconstruction example. Uh, I just put it uh, close. I don't know if you have any idea what. The, ex the example uh, does and how this compares. Uh, so there were a few outputs of that. Uh, What's GD? Mm -hmm. be the gradient descent one, yeah. Uh, I think you can, yeah. Without regularization, it's hopeless to compare these things. Um, and 10 iterations clearly is not enough, but you know, I don't know how many subset views and all of that stuff. So I, I think uh, discussion for another day. Okay, it just it was just to put it in perspective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. To have to yeah. show basically. Great.
thank you. Uh, all right, so I think we'll we have to go on. Sorry that I'm I'm pushing a little bit, but it's quite a lot to cover today. Is that one? Ash, which one of these? Uh, one's a PDF and one's a it doesn't matter. Maybe it's PDF. I think it will show you about it. Yeah, it showed up for me online. Oh, she figured out the group or something. Oh, oh. All right. Yeah, good. Okay. <clears throat> good. Uh, so while it's loading, I guess I can I can start. We can jump straight in a sec slide when it's up um, but so the the idea of the geometry because coming into the hackathon I sort of had uh, no idea exactly what exactly that meant uh, but basically what we want is that the images should be somehow aware of where they're positioned spatially so for example if you query and say voxel index one five hundred or whatever you should be able to get the location of the middle of that voxel in millimeter space so similar to any uh, you know, viewer then, if you open up two images and one's acquired you know, in this direction, one's acquired in this direction, if they've got that information, they can then overlay the images over the top. Um, you might be able to do it just in the web viewer. Works all right for me. Sorry. Maybe the PDF will be easier. I don't know why it needs me to sign in. Right. You got the PDF, about three down. Do I? If you click open a new tab and then start typing in OneDrive, and then it was, if you click down about three times, that on it, that one. They are, but I'm sure it's going to. What's the Hello, PDF? Dave? <laughs> All right. Keep on talking. Keep talking. Right. <laughs> yeah, try not to be distracted. Uh, so um, basically, there's three reasons why we want that information. So firstly, so that we can do resampling then. So if we've got a, an image fired with the PET and one with the MR, we want to be able to resample into the same voxelized grid. So once you do that, for example, you could uh, uh, sample the MR into the PET space and then use that as a prior um, or potentially you can start to do more synergistic things where you're getting priors propagating both ways between but we're able to uh, to use that information. Um, another goal would be that we can reconstruct directly into vendor space so that if we had take a, a vendor PET reconstruction and a reconstruction then uh, which you know through surf from stir uh, we want to be able to automatically be able to align those over the top of one another. Um, currently you can sort of take a little bit of just playing around or maybe some registration or that sort of thing to get them aligned. And then the the uh, third, oh you got it, perfect. Uh, so then the third goal is uh, for incorporating other information. So for example, motion estimates, uh, I think is the sort of uh, main one. And this was uh, the main reason I'm interested in this is to be able to have our, our motion estimates be relevant in, within our reconstruction so that we can um, do those corrections. So currently a lot of these things can be done, but it requires a bit of uh, sort of massaging the data, maybe some registrations or resamplings uh, to be able to use. And this could potentially make it a little bit more smoother. Uh, so next slide, yeah. Uh, so it all gets uh, quite confusing. Um, so I thought it's probably best just to quickly run through uh, some of the terms, um, which is sort of, uh, everyone seems to use these different terms, uh, but these are the ones I sort of uh, picked for uh, the documentation that I've written. Um, so there's a point called the frame of reference, and so this point is uh, in an image the, the where the spatial coordinate is zero, zero, zero. So often for a scanner, uh, you'll go in and there's a, a laser coming down, and then wherever that laser sort of lines up with will become in reconstruction images the zero 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 point. Um, but it's it's arbitrary. It doesn't necessarily correspond to anything. Uh, but it moves 
moves with respect to something. So uh, it can either stay stationary with the gantry, uh, it can move with the bed, so stay stationary with the bed, uh, and then you'll get a stationary image over multiple bed positions. Um, or it can be uh, with respect to the patient, which in most contexts is almost the same as the bed uh, anyway. So it doesn't actually usually consider patient motion, uh, but it's more like if they flip around their orientation, then the image would flip. Uh, there's an origin, which is the vector from the frame of reference to the middle of the voxel with index 000. Um, so for stir, that 000 index is actually kind of arbitrary and can be anywhere, but usually towards the middle of the end of an image. Uh, but in uh, other packages like ITK or Nifty, that 000 is at a corner. So it will be the vector to the corner of the image. Uh, next slide. Um, uh, there's uh, the term usually we talk about is LPS. So this is the orientation that uh, is proposed that we use within SURF. Uh, so what that means is that the first axis goes from right to left, so leftwards. The second goes from anterior to posterior, so posterior woods. And then the third axis goes from inferior to superior. Uh, so this is sort of the, uh, the standard um, convention that seems to be used in most packages. It's not used by Nifty, Nifty uses RAS. Um, uh, yep, this is the standard. Um, I just put a little comment in there that actually though within ITK, they, when they talk about their direction, they're not talking about the direction that more positive runs in. They talk about the direction that the origin is in, so it makes everything the exact reverse. So even though ITK is in LPS, they call it RAI, just to add a layer of complexity. Yeah. Uh, so LPS is defined uh, in reference to the patient position or in reference? Of yes, it's a patient-based orientation. So. If you uh, have an image that's uh, physically ordered in LPS and you acquire in um, uh, head first supine or head first uh, prone, prone um, then you'll get an image where the voxels are actually, uh, well, they're flipped around, but they'll be in such a way that the image appears similar. Yeah. So you have to know, in, so STIR currently is gantry based. So it's always to the left of the gantry, up of the gantry and into the gantry. Uh, so you have to know which way the patient is orientated to be able to convert to LPS. Um, which of course complicates things. Uh, so yeah, there's a nice little uh, uh, diagram there which I stole from the uh, ITK proposals. Um, so yeah, if it runs with that stuff then it's good. Uh, but yeah, so this is a, the X, Y, Z there is different to uh, STIRS uh, definition for X, Y, Z. Uh, the Y would be flipped in STIR. Uh, but it gives you a, an idea. And we then have to be able to express those coordinates. We don't actually have to have the voxels running left uh, LPS, but we have to be able to, if you query a voxel, know where that is. Uh, yep, and then uh, just quickly, you've also got spacing. So the space in between the voxels, uh, a direction, which is a three by three matrix of unit vectors in the direction of each. Uh, so that allows you to have uh, an image that doesn't run exactly left, up and down. It can be on an oblique angle. Uh, and a transformation matrix, uh, which is four by four, which takes all of this into account. And if you multiply your point by this transformation matrix, you can convert it from the voxel index into uh, a, a um, position in space. Uh, so those are probably the definitions. Uh, next slide down. Um, so what has what we've uh, uh, sort of added into SURF is a new class called Geometrical Info. Uh, so this class will be owned by an, by an image, so it'll have a reference to this. Um, it's super basic at the moment. Uh, it should eventually have the ability to actually transform an index into a, a physical point, which is its uh, main purpose, but I haven't actually had to use that functionality yet, so I haven't actually implemented it. 
Um, if we jump to the next slide, though, is a bit more interesting. It's a specific implementation of the geometrical info. So that's essentially a uh, virtual class uh, that won't get used. Uh, the reason we split it up is because STIR does the same thing. It allows potentially for images that aren't uh, voxels on a regular Cartesian grid. Um, so uh, I don't know, you could have a polar based image or something like that. Um, but so the implementation is essentially we have uh, fields internally for each of those uh, pieces of data that we need and getters and setters, well, not setters, it's um, constant more or less, but getters to get each of those um, and the ability to get that transform matrix. So, um, essentially uh, quite simple, it's just data. Um, where am I going? Uh, yep, yeah, and so additionally, Richard has, I think, sort of 80 90% implemented the you know, work, what do the conversions work 100% well, or we 99%? It's just that Q fact that yeah. flips, yeah. Um, but so it's, it's more or less uh, implemented within uh, Surfer Edge at the moment, uh, so that we should be able to uh, go from a uh, stir image into an empty image, uh, which gets us halfway to get into the EMR image, um, which I'll get to a little bit in a sec. Um, so one thing still remaining uh, to do is to unify the image hierarchy, which this is what I was uh, talking a little bit about before. So at the moment, we've just got an abstract container, and then you've got a pet image data and an MR image data, which come directly from the abstract container. Um, but we want to pop in the middle there a generic image data, uh, which will have things that all images have. So, um, so on my screen, you can't see that. Um, <laughs> uh, so the um, image data will have uh, it will um, have the responsibility of having a reference to a geometrical info, for example. Um, the pet image data and the MR image data would be sort of generic, uh, and then we have concrete implementations which are stir. Gadgetron um, could potentially in the future use other uh, reconstructions uh, and also the, uh, well, I call it a nifty image data, um, but whatever um, it's decided to be called. Um, and so potentially then we're able to convert from a pet image data to a nifty image data and then a nifty image data into an AMR image data or reverse order through that chain. Um, and also the nifty image data uh, could there could potentially be other conversion types as well, uh, an ITK image data or whatever. So it's all aimed to try and be fairly flexible and agnostic to, as to exactly which packages it uses. Um, and then acquisition data sort of sits over to the, to the side. Um, next slide. What am I talking about here? Just close to this. Ah, yeah, so uh, this is on the stir side. So in order to be able to do this, we had to go back into STIR and be able to add a bit more functionality to be able to actually get the information. Uh, so sort of the key change is we need to give discretized density a function called get LPS coordinates for indices. And once you can do that, you can work out all the, the rest of the, um, the information that's required. Um, mm -hmm. uh, yes, so this is still, this is probably the, the more tricky part that uh, took a bit of time is that the stir origin is different from the vendor origin. Um, and it's a little bit difficult to, once you've got a, an image, uh, it doesn't necessarily encode what scanner it came from. So we can't necessarily take a stir image and know where the origin should be if it's a default for a scanner site. So the sort of robust way to actually be able to have our images consistent with the vendor origin is to actually modify the reconstruction and make force the reconstruction itself to have the same origin. Uh, so what that means is we had to go back, there was some uh, sort of hard coded things in the projectors, et cetera, that mean that projectors would only work if the image is centered um, uh, through the gantry and that sort of thing. Uh, so, a lot of going back through and replacing all the conversions from index space to image space with uh, the appropriate functions that take everything into account. 
um, and it will also require uh, new implementations of the uh, well all the projectors. So we have a um, sort of uh, preliminary one for the ray tracing projector, but actually after some discussions, we decided we're going to change that again. So it's kind of um, still needs to be done. Um, and so this is the last slide. Uh, other to do is the whole get neutron side, but um, which I I guess I won't have uh, any time to even uh, look at. So if uh, if uh, there's any Gadgetron uh, gurus or people who'd like to learn more about Gadgetron out there, that would be a super fun job for you to do. <laughs> You're honest. <laughs> <laughs> Next uh, hack topic. Yeah, well, I think it's, it's essentially doing some of that already because. Mm. But uh, let's uh, come back to that later when we have some update from him on the simulation side. Uh, yeah, so fair amount of work to get this all working. Uh, we have, in the meantime, uh, thanks to Ashley to and then uh, a phantom acquisition on the MMR to both PET and MR where we move things and so on. Uh, so that would be used as validation. Once we know that that phantom acquisition is enough for the purpose and it works well, we would then publish size how you do your phantom acquisition and then ask other size to do the same. Uh, because it, so our impression is that this is so on the surface easy and on the deep and detail actually very hard uh, that it would be useful to just make a publication on that in itself and saying how do you test these things and how do you uh, how do you think about it how would are all these different coordinate systems yeah yeah for example I didn't even talk about bed bed offsets if the bed's moving around um, which the, if we, we use the appropriate uh, function calls, this will be taken into account. Um, and then things like offsets. So there's a, a offset. We don't know exactly where the numbers are, but hidden somewhere in the image of where from the middle of the gantry, the, uh, the origin is actually set, uh, set to. So there's... Um, mm. just, a, just a quick uh, comment. I need to switch rooms, so please don't start uh, my presentation with I'll be back in a few minutes. Sure. Question time synchronization, especially for example, when moving bed offsets automatically, you have also some interest in that. Yeah. Also in other situations. No, well, this, yeah, this, that, that's a whole other can of worms, actually. Um, but yeah, this doesn't take into account any time synchronization. Especially important for MR and bed. Yeah. And your yeah. So two, two imaging modalities, but also two imaging software. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 So currently, uh, I, I believe uh, in the things that I'm doing, the synchronization is um, this is according to Chris, sort of on the order of a second. So it's high, fine for, for the head motion stuff that I'm working on. Well, fine, but um, you know, probably well, definitely needs to be more accurate. Uh, people have. Uh, Richard Member has uh, worked on this before, um, but I think still getting right down to the uh, millisecond accuracy is is uh, not clear. Yeah, and, and my understanding on that is that the manufacturers are are getting there now. That one approach for us would be to say, well, they they solve it, and now we're fine. <laughs> Going back for the older software, you have to put them on the background. But um, so, uh, like the PET, if I'm not wrong, the PET and the AMR they use different clocks, and then and then not even necessarily running at the same speed as each other, so they can get out of sync, right? But presumably, all of PET is consistent with all of PET, and all of MR is consistent with all of MR, regardless of if you move the bed around or anything like that. Surely. So in that sense, it's just. Uh, I I believe, as far as I remember, in the MR there are four independent clocks, or at least three. So the gating input and so on has its own clock. Okay. So. <laughs> yeah. And it's not clear which is getting used when, but uh, yeah. that's another thing.
Yeah. <laughs> I don't think removing the debt should do anything to the property. So. Yeah. No, I wouldn't think so. The infrastructure software wise, let's say you, you get some information, assuming they have the right information about the locations right. and the right. time, then and the infrastructure exists, That's it. or at least there may be some pieces missing, but... Yeah, mm. yeah I, uh, I haven't thought about it too much, but how exactly you would implement that. Well, uh, we don't, uh, at the moment we don't have any fields or whatever for the timing. Mm. Right now we have them in Gadstrom, we have them in Stur, but we haven't got that in here. No, to come. Yeah. Okay, uh, so a lot of hard work here, so and, and, and a bit boring, and also maybe not circular but spiral uh, thoughts. On this uh, <laughs> hopefully it gets out of the circle, <laughs> and we, we spiral inwards as opposed to outwards. Uh, and yeah, present to users. Yeah, we thought that would be. Yeah, a good topic, but then concentrating on the stir side. So, yeah. uh, okay, uh, good. Thank you. Any, uh, so, you know, at the moment we're trying to test most of this with with the MMR and then the same questions with for GEO spinner. I think we probably understand the GE side more than the uh, than the MMR in all honesty, but uh, I'm sh there will be surprises. And so the phantom acquisition, we discussed about that at the time as well, but so th there are stupid things in there like rotate your phantom a bit to the right <laughs> and see what happens because what does it mean to the right in the coordinate system from your scanner? We don't know really. All my guesses, but um, okay. Uh, any further comments, questions? Oh, uh, Johannes, are you back? It looked like he put himself. Yes. Back. Okay. Good. Uh, do you do you want to share, or I do it from here? I can. Uh, so that means if I share it, I can press enter myself, right? Okay, then let's do this. Okay. Ah, I can't do it as long as somebody else does it. Okay, yeah. Let me stop. Yep. Huh? Can you see this? Yep, yeah. Yep, works fine. Okay. So Okay, now let's uh, start with a recap what, what I'm doing. So it's the, the aim is to develop and implement a flexible dynamic PetMR simulation framework. And as it's, uh, as Evgeny pointed out that, uh, uh, that the philosophy is to implement it in C++, it's what I'm doing right now. And then uh, Evgeny will put it into MATLAB and Python. So the result is that um, we, I got it to run and what every all the images that you're going to see is is a reconstruction of an ISMM raw data file, and I'm just going to talk about uh, MR today, not PET. And so what it what it can now do is uh, do an arbitrary contrast dynamic and motion dynamic simulation, which also can be combined. And the output is an ISMM raw data file, including the trajectory information. And on the left, you see some reconstruction of a of a low resolution scan where I let the patient breathe very slowly and very slow heartbeat. And you can see that the blood and uh, the myocardium and the atria are taking up some contrast agent. But it's not very, very realistic, but it's just that you can see it resolved. And so what the framework is, is that, um, that there's an anatomy model needs to be put in, some kind of a segmentation where each voxel is assigned some uh, integer, which labels basically which uh, which tissue it is, and you also can have some kind of a deformation field which uh, puts uh, the, the segmentation into motion. Then you go through some contrast and enco encoding process where you sample the case base, and then the output is some um, 
realistic uh, PETMA, hopefully realistic PETMA data simulation, which then can, for example, be put into some image registration and get some quantitative comparison to, uh, to, to the input. Or you can, uh, I don't know, test your reconstruction algorithms on it. So in the plan for the surf module was to be able to put uh, some tissue and dynamics parameters into it. First of all, the simulation module, <laughs> module is in the middle here, and you give it the, the motion field and the tissue map uh, should be put in, in some formatted way into the simulation module, um, which is currently simulated with the X cap, but in principle it should be able to, it will be able to be um, exchanged with any numerical simulation. And then the simulation is done based on the raw data files that you provide with from the scanner. So you send an ISMM raw data uh, file or some hardware files for the PET side. And also you can put in some additional uh, optional parameters, such as you can change the flip angle in the MR or the, the echo times. And then you get some raw data files out and then you can put it into any script or any recall. So that uh, this is a standardized format. So what I did is I wrote some XML parser that um, takes in some uh, parameters here. For example, you can, you if you want to put in a phantom or a segmentation, you uh, you have to say you have to specify what the labels in your uh, segmentation mean. That means you write for each tissue parameter in your in your segmentation. For example, if you have one somewhere in a box or sitting, you write in your XML script that mark, uh, the one is myocardium. You assign it some. MR parameters and some PET parameters. And based on those uh, parameters here, then in the voxel one way you can see on the right, you will fill the myocardium with contrast. And then one for each label, you have to write one of those uh, little, little snippets. And that get pass, uh, passed then into the, into, the, uh, into the simulation. So and then there's something which is called a dynamic, which carries some data, some signal, and some information on the dynamic process, for example, a motion field, or it could be some, it could be something else. And this thing, it can bin data, and it can also do something with information on the process. And how it works is that uh, you have some time axis, and for example, in the contrast, uh, uh, for contrast dynamic, you have some signal curve that should uh, define the contrast, which is. Uh, which should be simulated in one of your voxels during the acquisition. So each for, for each time point during the acquisition, you, uh, you, for this contrast dynamic, the tissue, the information on the dynamics would be just the uh, two extremes, what, what means a tissue parameter for signal curve equal to one, and one for signal curve equal to zero, and then the tissue in parameter in between at time t tilde is then the linear interpolation between those two extremes. This is how the contrast, the tissues are interpolated over the, over the time. And the signals that you have to pass are, can either be, are given by some, some set of points. So it's just a pair of time and value. And you can, for example, if you just give the red dots, then you get this kind of signal. Or if you get a, give it more dots, then the signal will, be, will uh, look nicer. And this, uh, these signals that I have implemented are normed between zero and one. So what you have to do, basically, you just have to, uh, yeah, wait, let's talk about that later. And for the motion dynamic, it does the same thing. So you have a set of motion fields, for example. For your dynamic object, object carries a set of motion fields that discre uh, describe the discrete states in between. You can give it any signal curve, and it will interpolate between the states during the acquisition to have a uh, continuous simulation of motion instead of some discrete motion states. And once you have, uh, you have to throw them all in together because if you want to simulate them at the same time, if you would have, example, for example, have two dynamic uh, dynamics in your simulation, the first is, for example, a motion dynamic, which the patient breathes in once and breathes out once during the whole acquisition, and you want to simulate three of those motion states, you have to divide this axis into three states. And for example, if you want to have a second dynamic added, which is, for example, some contrast agent changing, in this case, the contrast agent flows in, then you uh, divide this, for example, in an arbitrary number of bins, which in this case is again three, and then you know at which time point, which uh, dynamic state you have to simulate. 
And if you then put what the code does, it then puts these uh, bint acquisitions uh, in, it intersects them all. And then you can see, okay, for the first bracket here, you know that the dynamic should be, at uh, the different phantom should in the motion dynamic state one and the contrast dynamic state also state one. And then this finds out which dynamic to simulate during the whole acquisition process. And the empty bins, they're just omitted because they don't, they don't carry any data. Yeah, code-wise, the, the application of this currently looks like this. So you have some kind of dynamic simulation that you can give a path to a raw data file. And then you say, you generate some um, a cardiac dynamic, for example, and the respiratory dynamic for, in this case, it's 10 states each. And then you say, uh, I want to have my acquisitions vector from somewhere. I want to have uh, two signal curves. One is a sinus and one is just a ramp. And then, for example, you would set the sinus signal to the respiratory dynamic and you would tell it to bin the acquisitions. You would uh, give it to some, would give pass it some motion information. You can also tell it if, it's, if the motion fields are cyclic or if they're just, uh, if they end. And then you would add them to your dynamic simulation and press play, which in this case is uh, simulate dynamics. And then you get something out. For example, in the upper part, you can see it's, this is very low res now. And you can see it's a 3D Cartesian acquisition for the 10 dynamics acquired in flash contrast. So that means 10 times the full case space is sampled. And there you have a continuous uh, inflow of contrast into your left and right myocardium during respiratory motion at the frequency of three hertz, so you can't see anything. And the lower part is some um, more sophisticated tra uh, radial trajectory where there's no contrast inflow, but uh, the simulation is doing cardiac and respiratory motion at the same time. And again, those are not uh, the simulations, but they are the reconstructions of the already simulated data. And the lower part is then binned into six uh, respiratory signals after sampling one case base already. So this is what, yes? Uh, can I quickly ask, so I, I, I wasn't aware that in Dutch Trump we have radial things, how, how, because I don't think we have that in our... Uh, no, this is, uh, no, I wrote some encoding operators for, uh, that you can pass a trajectory to, and I took the code from that from Gadgetron, they have, uh, they have, non-uniform Fourier transforms that you can run on the CPU and also some the GPU, but this is the CPU version. Okay, so it's not using the surf acquisition model at the moment, you, you sort of... It is, but I wrote an, an encoding operator which now the forward uh, model employs. Or you can tell the forward model to employ it. If you don't tell it to do it, it just uses the Cartesian one. Probably should be a, a separate pull request and it's something well, maybe to discuss later on. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Okay, so wait to conclude. So there's some, um, uh, it, it's able to do this, and uh, as I said, the, form, the, the interface is not done yet. And that we hope that we can just that this, that this uh, will improve reproducibility because you can just. Uh, if you have a simulation, you don't need to, you can just give the raw data file on some website and people can download it and use it. And hopefully this will make people want to use Surf also. Okay, that was it. That's great, thank you. Uh, questions? Remarks? Hi. Um, one question I have, uh, what is the role of the X cut on the in the beginning? So it's just that we that I, that the XCAT is currently the uh, the best segmentation we have. So it's just we what we get out of it is just we get the binary data out with the segmentations and the motion fields, and afterwards the XCAT doesn't play any role anymore. It's just that the simulations I showed are based on the XCAT motion model and tissue segmentation. So it is just for demonstration. Yes, so the exit has basically nothing to do with it. It's just that, you know, 
It's just that I, the, the images I show are based on the Xcode. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure the Behind the scenes, there are file format issues and, and all of that stuff, yes. Uh, because if you say I'm using the XCAT, it outfits out binary files, but it doesn't need just the binary file, you need to know about those files and other reasons. But in principle, it should be arranged that it can be any labeled image in next image. Yes, yeah, so, yes, the way I set it up is some, you can give it some HDF5 file with the proper uh, subpath which you can easily save from MATLAB. And um, so when people want to use it, they can just use this interface and don't have to worry about it. So, so they just have to worry about having the correct substructure in your HDF5 thing. And then you should be, then the, the simulation, it has a method to read from the HDF5 file to get the segmentation in the cardiac and respiratory motion fields. Would it uh, make sense for that HF5 file part to eventually come from an image data? Or does it need more? I mean, is, is, if image data is a file format, I guess, yes. It's the, it's the other way around, yes. Uh, image data can read from multiple file formats or maybe everything. So, uh, okay. Yeah, so, yeah, I have to, when once I, uh, the whole, Code review on the surfs uh, on the surf reg side is done. And I will have to do some cleaning up because the container classes I'm using are not very. Uh, yeah, they rely heavily on ISM or MRD, and um, because the, it doesn't because I needed some container class, but I will have to do some cleaning up afterwards. Once there's maybe a surf container class which is more generic and I can use it independently. And the other question I have about the dynamic simulation for MRI. Do you first use the contrast changing and then you apply the motion methods? Or? Yes, that's true. Yeah. So I, I fill it with some contrast and then I do, uh, because then I still have, uh, I got one reference phase which is static and which is not um, corrupted by the interpolation effect. So I fill that one and then I deform it. So what is the typical size of data that you end up with when, when you have a dynamic uh, acquisition with all these included? Well, this, uh, the, can you see this now? The lower one is, uh, so it's the same size as the, this, the hardware file that you put into the simulation. It just replaces the data. So in the case, lower case where you have the um, the motion, so if you one case space is like 187 megabyte. And it's a standardized format, so you can just put it, as long as the reconstruction can read the file format, you get all the information from the header, what the acquisition timestamps are, what the TE was, the size of the case space, the trajectory information, everything is in this file. For, for or double dynamics, it must be huge. No, so the I just I, the, the I just simulate the phantom, and then I make I, I, I Fourier transform and save only the lines which are acquired in this one motion phase, based on the surrogate signal that you give it. So the size is exactly the one as you give as a template. Yeah, so it depends on how many on your MR sequence essentially. So underlying you know, the simulation, it, it figures out how what position everything has to be at a particular time point. And that, in effect, sample. So if you if you have a really slow MR sequence with very few samples, the file starts with small. Obviously, you won't be able to reconstruct a good image. Now. Yeah, uh, just a quick question. Uh, when you say slight five where you are now, uh, the paired optional parameters, let's say, uh, do you mean some uh, corrections for things to be done? Excuse me, I couldn't, I couldn't hear that. Sorry, uh, for paired optional parameters, what is defined like that for that? Is it uh, some corrections that are applied to the simulation? Actually, uh, I don't know. 
Yeah, so uh, it's, a, it's a discussion we had a little bit, but not extensively. What information do we have to pass to the, to the pet site? At, at the moment, really, the only things that pet simulation needs is uh, activity measure and uh, attenuation for the voxel. That's the only thing that we know in uh, current whole projectors. And then similar to on the MR, so the contrast MR, contrast can change, so the activity would then be able to change. You probably wouldn't change your uh, attenuation value. Uh, that's the only thing that at the moment we, we plan to put in, but you could have other things related to, to post from the range where you want to say, okay, I have different types of material, if you would ever be able to model that. Uh, is there anything else? I don't think so. Uh, but we, yeah, in, in your, so it talked about, this is the object model, it's with the patient is supposed to look like the other bit is then what is your your scanner uh, and correction things and so on are sitting over there normalization and all of those they, they sit on the uh, on the raw data front that's used as a template to generate object generation I guess you possibly need radio tracer to have energies all right. Uh, I have a question. This is Edo uh, for Johannes. Uh, so I understand that you, by the segmentation, you set to each tissue some MR parameters like T1, T2, and stuff like that. I'm not sure I understand exactly what do you change with the dynamics. See, the dynamic signal goes from zero to one. What, what do you actually change? Do you change? Yeah, so everything you want. So the thing is, the dynamic signal changes between 0 and 1. And now, if you want to have a class, uh, an object of type uh, contrast dynamics, you have to tell it one time the signal between 0 and 1. And once, and the other thing you have to tell it, what does the tissue parameter at signal 0 mean? And what is, what is the tissue parameter at signal 1? Right. And and you can, it can change all of the T1, T2. Uh, yes, you can tell it, okay, if the contrast agent flows in and you have this concentration of contrast agent and you, the maximum, then you assign to one. You have T1 of 400 milliseconds. And if there's no contrast agent in, you have 1000 milliseconds, then it will follow this curve. In between. But you can, for a cluster of labels, you can give it also a cluster of labels so you can make all the blood have the same changes and you can make myocardium have a different signal curve and different t1 values during the acquisition it just for it just for it interpolates between the what the meaning of signal equal to zero and signal equal, equal to one is yeah thank you seems very realistic yeah i think it's quite flexible um, i mean it, it, we could potentially later on go away from linear interpolation and, and other models and so on, but uh, this would get us quite far. Yes, it's, for example, this can also then interpolate between PET parameters, so you can, for example, couple the lung tissue attenuation to the respiratory signal to simulate some attenuation, um, attenu attenuation map changes during breathing. Yeah. This is maybe also an application of this, not just yeah. contrast. Yeah, sure, yeah. Okay. So this will become available? So the, the, it's all already public on, uh, on Johannes' fork, but at some point we'll have to spend the day reviewing the code and uh, then Johannes will spend the month uh, changing it all. <laughs> uh, or maybe it's the other way around. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean... I think we've got the time for the next fortnight to do that. Yeah. Uh, so there, there is going to be a fair amount of code review for all of these things because they, we talk, talk to each other, but it's not really that we all agree on conventions and then naming and all of that stuff. So, so that's just that. This is really an, an essential. Uh, it's, it's, 
and for, it's impressive, uh, I think. Yeah, kind of obvious that it should have been existing for many, many years, but <laughs> it's still uh, yeah, it's, it's amazing a, that we have to got it. Yeah. Yeah, and but, I mean, it's a lot of work, and I, I think the the overall framework and so on, the way it's set up, is quite nice and flexible. Well, I have to still yet test it to some motion model which is not the X cut, but I think it's uh, will look the same. Sure. Yeah. Uh, and so it's yeah, it's it's using surf edge for the motion interpolation. It's using the surf acquisition models and all of that stuff for the actual simulations. It all fits together. Yeah, the only thing I'm a little bit worried about is the two D data support because I I have to do put this in to see what comes out of it, or if it'll give me a million sec faults. So this is one of the things I still want to implement. 2D data? Yeah, if you want to give 2D uh, MI acquisitions. If you want to do exercises, for example, for in a very simplistic way with 2D data, it may be... Yeah. Well, just make a 3D with one slice. Yes. Yes, let's see if this works or if it tells me that it's uh, not possible. <laughs> I don't know yet. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Great. So I do realize I, I added this to the hackathon agenda. It wasn't really a hackathon effort. It uh, was the exchange. and. Uh, There's a like, prolonged hackathon. Yeah, yeah. Great. Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I asked Palak to just give a, a brief summary on, on Hackathon and later efforts on uh, supporting the GE Cigna on the pet side. Okay, so uh, during Hackathon we were supposed to complete a few tasks which included um, so that we can support GE Cigna reconstructions with STAIR and um, what we wanted to do is that we wanted to read uncompressed sinograms, which are in HDF5 format, uh, which we get from G uh, the scanner after a uh, scan is conducted. And uh, so after reading them, we, we uh, eventually should be able to convert it into STIR into file format so that we can reconstruct image with STIR. Uh, we also wanted to include um, a class which can read geometric correction factors from HDF5 file so that we can completely do normalization correction with STIR. And uh, we wanted uh, to also implement VQC shifts, as uh, Ash discussed, uh, that we want to include it within the image reconstruction with STIR. So um, apart from that, we wanted to do, uh, we wanted to include MRAC uh, for G Sigma as well. So from all of these tasks that were needed to be tackled, we are able to read the sinograms, uncompressed sinograms, but still we have some issues with um, getting these segment-based sinograms out. Um, with STIR and uh, what we have done is that whatever implementation was done with HDF5 uh, file format, Nikos has created an IO class HDF5 wrapper in which all the implementation is included just over there, so everything's hidden. And then we have uh, uh, the classes, uh, respective classes to read, to get the viewgram from this HDF5 implementation, and then, then we can use a utility, for example, uh, to read the sinograms. We first read the, uh, the data set from HDF5 file, then we get the viewgram for a particular segment number, view number, using a different class, which is ROG data from HDF5, and then we convert it into STIR inter file using the utility. Uh, which is called conv hdf 5 to interfile. So um, basically from this, we can get the STIR-based uh, sinograms and we can reconstruct 
uh, the data, but we still have a few issues to tackle over there. And uh, similarly, we can also read geometric correction factors from HF type 5, so there is a utility which reads it, and uh, now we have to apply it to the norm factors to uh, complete normalization correction. And Ben has been working on MRAC size, and uh, his implementations include taking the image, which has all the hardware already in it, and then it's already resampled in image, converting into storage file, and that can be applied directly as an that can be used as an attenuation image directly. Um, Yes, and uh, we had another issue to tackle uh, regarding interleaving. Uh, so we created a map between uh, the sinograms from that were output from the stir and sinograms from two books, and we saw that there is an interleaving issue with view numbers, and we have handled it by uh, reading the detector numbers in opposite direction. So rather than going plan clockwise, it's going anti-clockwise. Yeah, so this this is about it, the summary. If Sorry, how does reading it from clockwise, or is that better than reading it clockwise? Sorry. That's the way it's encoded. Mm, okay. Right. Just lost the connection. Yeah, which is why we, we want to rotate the phantom, I see. <laughs> which way does the clock run? <laughs> yeah. Is it, yeah, it's, it's sort of a minefield of conventions, the whole thing. Uh, it seems that with changing that convention, we got quite similar results. Uh, in the end, we need to test with the phantom. Uh, so also somewhat painful work, uh, but it will be incredibly useful. Let go. Uh, yep. Is this uh, now close to? with the type of slide to uh, so I think the my understanding of it all what you're doing on the IO side right now we have to squash the time of flight yeah. dimension yeah. which actually makes it a little bit more complicated than if you would be putting it into the time of flight branch uh, it will make your life easier where we are right now. Uh, Nikos, uh, on the time of flight, very brief update. Uh, Nikos submitted it to a journal that in the end uh, came back and said that uh, it's not appropriate for that journal. Uh, let's not go there in a lot of detail, so he just resubmitted it to PMB. And he said he would make the time of flight branch uh, public now, not wait for the results. Uh, but he said that two weeks ago and it hasn't happened yet. I'm sure he's busy. Uh, the, there is a bit of an issue that the time of flight branch is very messy. Uh, and I think, in, I mean, the commit history and so on. So it, it might be cleaning that up a little bit before. But he said he would do it soon. Yeah. All right. So my, yeah, so that concludes our uh, first part of the meeting on the hackathon. So uh, overall, I mean, you, you so if maybe you, those who weren't there get the feeling that uh, there were a lot of things started there, and it was really useful to have all those discussions and sit together. The atmosphere was really great, and then you go home and you say, well, actually, none of this is more or less finished. Well, a few things were, but other things were not, and then you have to follow it up, obviously, but. The, I think the overall feedback was that the hackathon was a success, it should be repeated. And we thought they would do one every two, uh, well, twice per year, roughly. That's the plan. Takes up a lot of your time. Obviously, uh, two days gone. But, uh, it's, but it's very nice to all sit together and work on different but related aspects. Uh, I don't know, actually, we had a document uh, where we were going to put some 
brief description of experience in there. Um, did anybody actually do that or not? There is a shared link down there. Uh, Feedback from the from the You had like a I think you had a word document in the shared drive or something like that. Each group sent you an email about the work. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, it's in the report in yeah. the drive. Okay. Uh, so that should be as good as finished, you think? Or it is finished? Um, I believe somebody still hasn't replied. Okay. Mm -hmm. We just add it as an action item to. We're not going to check it now. Have you noticed we have projects in search now? Yeah. So it's, it's a project there. And right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and then, I mean, we, we just need to sign that off and then we'll put that on the website. Good. Um, great. We're uh, about five minutes late, which is not too bad. Um, so I think we're, we're, we're doing okay. Do we need a quick break or are we just keeping going? Um, yeah. <laughs> We can all grab some food or go for the toilet while we, while we keep on going, otherwise we might be running out of time. So uh, the next half of our meeting is going to be on uh, GPU support, uh, not, not so much general multi-threading and all of those things, although you've seen in the user survey that's of interest as well. But uh, it's yeah. probably harder to do this via GPU, so we decided to uh, spend about 90 minutes on this, uh, maybe slightly less. Um, and that's uh, a difficult topic. And because of that, we've asked Sue Thorne and Philip uh, Gompon from uh, Software Outlook, which is an EPSRC funded activity uh, at uh, SDFC, to that. that looks at various aspects of uh, software development uh, to inform us uh, how that looks like. And so now I'm going to stop talking and give the word to Sue. Okay, thank you everyone. Um, so first I thought I'd introduce a little bit about what Software Outlook is and what we can do for CCP Petamar, uh, and then talk a bit more about the um, fast forward transforms and the um, GPU work. So Outlook is funded as part of COSEC, um, which used to be known as the service level agreement between EPSRC and STFC supporting the CCPs. So Eduardo and Evgeny and Martin, I think, are all also partly funded under COSEC. Oh, is that not? Am I not sharing? Yeah, yes, 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 you are. Yeah, uh, but yours. <laughs> I'm seeing your screen, <laughs> not your presentation. Ah, uh, just as I. Oh, yeah. so maybe it's projecting there. Yeah, it's projecting. So you've got mm. three screens now. We've got far too many screens. Right. Maybe not. Can, can we unplug? Yeah. Might, might help. Yeah. What happens? No. Trying to sort out all our screen. Yes. Oh, now we got the right. Yes. Maybe we can read it. As long as you can read it. I don't know what my my laptop was linked up to another screen as well. Anyway, sorry, it's not perfect, but I saw that outlook. Um, so we um, there to assist the CCPs and the high-end computer solutions. Um, we're there to help them utilize the computational techniques, libraries, and current near future architectures. So it's a very broad remit. Um, the idea is that we're going to sort of provide a scan of upcoming technologies and architectures that CCPs should consider. So of course GPUs comes under that. Now, it's been made very clear to Software Outlook that we do not go in and do large-scale optimization of one particular CCP code. Um, that is not passed by remit we should be looking at more like overbridging work that will apply to a number of CCPs. So Software Outlook has been funded as part of the service level of 
POSEC since the 1980s. It used to be known as the High End Computing Project, so it's got a really long history. And we have covered a lot of topics in that history, of course, some of it was a very long time ago, so not relevant now. We are very limited in what we can do because we only have 1.5 of an FTE in funding. So Philippe and myself are the main people funded under Software Outlook. Uh, Luke Mason is the PI and Andrew Taylor, all at Archery, uh, is also funded a small amount of Software Outlook. To keep us on track and to make sure that we are doing um, applicable work to the CPPs, we do have a working group which has just been refreshed. So you'll see we've got some CCP representatives and then we have some representatives, um, representatives from um, the RSE field, from the Software Sustainability Institute. So that gives a really good broad overview. So here we've done a lot of work on using mixed precision, when you should and shouldn't use mixed precision in your codes. And an online training course has just gone up on our website. We've also been looking at code coupling, with respect to parallel scaling and as part of that we also um, be looking at how to use the profiler tau on very large and complex codes and that'll be another training course appearing soon. During the last year um, we conducted a software audit so this was a snapshot in time around the beginning of this year and asked all the CCPs and the high-end computer consortia and to provide us with details about their flagship software. So we have responses for 42 codes, and so we'd like to thank everyone who helped with that audit. Um, there, has been, there are reports that have come out from the software audit. Some of them can't be shared externally, because they're more very internal um, books. It's got a lot of the actual real nitty gritty information. Um, but a more public version of the report has gone to EPSRC and is being um, used by the EPSRC as they look into their new e-infrastructure roadmap. A part of the software audit, we also asked for work package suggestions for software outlook. And it broadly aligned under six different um, topics. So there's some people want to know a bit more about code coupling and mixed precision, which hopefully now our training courses are coming online, that's sorted. We were asked for help with mathematical kernels, including a request for CCP Petamar with, for um, some FFT work. And there was also a lot of requests for um, information about hybrid programming, which framework should they use, which will give the best um, efficiency versus how easy it will be to program. Additionally, we have to do some of this scalability work, which of course we can't do, and also ask about software sustainability. So it's like a really wide ranging request of work packages. And so the highlighted in red are the ones that have gone into our work plan for 2018 and 19. And of course we can't cover everything with 1.5 on FTE during that year. We're doing our best. Um, so this is just a highlight. So this is what our actual milestones are. So we've been looking into framework identifications for both for hybrid programming and for things like the, yeah, um, the FFTs. And then we've got comparative studies, which we're just starting to do. So hybrid, you mean CPU, GPU? Yeah, it's mainly for, yeah, CPU, GPU. But we could move on to accelerate it. That will never happen in this year, but maybe future. Yeah. Uh, so, fast forward transforms was something that uh, came about very much from interaction with Chris. Um, so the first thing was to do um, really a look to see which libraries are out there for fast forward transforms and we asked for both the uniform ones and also non-uniform FFPs. So now onto a software outlook website uh, you will find tables listing the uh, two forms of fast forward transform libraries along with their attributes. So there's things like the licenses, what findings, of what level of parallelism there is. Um, so to help the CCPs pick at least a list of fast forward transform libraries 
um, that they should investigate. Um, so we're about to start doing, well, we're just doing some benchmarking of these um, fast flow transforms. So we will speak more about this in a moment, but I just wanted to highlight that because Software Outlook has to like bridge a number of the CCPs, we're not going to just focus on the libraries that are of interest, CCP Petamar. So um, one of the important things for CCP Petamar is that the libraries should be compatible with being an Apache 2 license, but we will be spreading um, beyond that. And also, hopefully look at some Fortran-based benchmarks because we also have a number of CCPs that are using Fortran. The GPU frameworks work, um, it could snowball into something absolutely enormous. So obviously we've got to keep real tight reins on it. So this is a, um, on the right hand side you have the various different architectures. So you've got the NVIDIA GPUs, the AMD GPUs and so on. And then in the middle of all things like the CUDA, so that's um, been developed by NVIDIA so that you can utilize your NVIDIA GPU. You've got your OpenCL, OpenMP 4.0 and beyond and open ACC, and so how they all interact, which can be used for these different architectures. And beyond the CUDAs and the open CLs, there are libraries and frameworks that build like wrappers around CUDA um, and also um, provide um, functions using these um, frameworks. So it's sort of like this two level approach going on. So at the top, I've got Thrust, Boost, Compute, and HSA Bolt. And I've grouped those together because they are wrappers to CUDA and OpenCL, etc. But they also are um, basically an extension to the C++ template. So they've extended it so that they can make use of these accelerators. And then Cocos and ArrayFire, they also provides, so Cocos provides um, wrappers to things like AMPs and other libraries and ArrayFire also they have lots of functions for example they have an FFT function, they have linear algebra functions um, which can all make use of for example NVIDIA GPUs and then you've got um, OCCA and OPS um, which again they have sort of more just wrappers to CUDA and OpenCL that, that there's no way that this slide contains every single framework that there is out there. Um, but it's to give you some idea that there's a huge amount of things that you could choose from, but not necessarily you would want to choose them. Uh, so CUDA, if it's been well coded, is generally considered to provide the best performance, but in general, lengthy porting procedure and filling for show you a tiny bit of code how horrible it is yes. <laughs> <laughs> and of course it's limited to NVIDIA but then you can go all the way to the other end where you could use Cocos or ArrayFire which would be easier to port and use and the GPU usage would be more hidden but and we've already had discussions with other CCPs who've tried using Cocos they've had problems with how to manipulate their data so that it can be used with Cocos so that's been a big drawback to them. So we're just at the start of this work. Um, what I would like to say before I hand over to Philippe, who will discuss a bit more about what we're really doing with the benchmarks and what we're looking into, um, I'd like to say that yesterday, Software Outlook had a very fruitful meeting with the RSE group in Sheffield, and they are um, real experts in GPUs and provide training throughout the UK um, and they're going off to the US to help in a hackathon um, on porting codes to GPUs. However, they are very CUDA based. Um, but Software Outlook will be partnering with them to provide training on this, if that ever is of use to you guys. And that is all I've got to say because I say we're very much at the beginning of this project.
Right, great. Thank you, Sue. Any questions at this point? And it's more to come, obviously, but uh, who wants to raise anything right now? Uh, seeing it's not yet, so maybe we come back to it after uh, Philip's uh, presentation might become a little bit more concrete, maybe. So let me see. Building it up here first. Sue, I had a tiny question whilst uh, Chris is loading his uh, presentation up, the next presentation up. Um, but I think the very last point of your very last slide, you said the people that used uh, Kokos, they had a problem. Um, was it about uh, data management? Was that it? I can't remember. Yes, yeah, so um, they, because they, they did set their code up in a certain way, which was right for what they've been doing without GPUs, but apparently Kokos, they've, um, really had to transform their the data to be able to use the COCOS framework because COCOS just wants the input data in a very different format to what they use. Yeah, because obviously in SURF we, we've been chatting about how the, the fact that we, we want to sort of minimise copying obviously between yeah. the CPU and the GPU and also that we want it to be as ambivalent as possible. Would yes. that mean we'd have to go right into the deep end with the stuff which is harder so that we have more control over that sort of stuff. So does that mean that things like array fire and cocos, because that last limitation um, are a little bit less suitable for us? Is that what that implies? Might be. It will depend on how your code is set up. Um, I personally haven't delved into the codes where they've had the problems yet, so I don't know what the exact issues were, but I've just they've described it as I'm a linear algebra person. Um, ultimately going back in my history and it's like they were saying you're trying to solve a linear algebra problem but your matrix is in a completely different format so you have to then like reformat it into their data type okay but i don't know more than that i, I expect know. they wanted a sparse matrix state forward projection or something like that but knowing a little about the real it's a linear algebra thing Right. But, I say, but they, they just use that as an example. They had more, not just linear algebra issues, the other parts of their codes. Okay, thanks. So uh, this is just an attempt to see what we can expect in terms of performance and code complexity if we start playing with GPUs. So this is very much work in progress because I started uh, this uh, only after we had our last meeting. So I, I didn't have the time to test all the possible frameworks thoroughly. So it's just to, to see, I tried a few of them, and it's just to, to show what we can expect. So we started from an, an example that was uh, suggested by Evgeny and uh, Eduardo. So we take uh, cubes of complex numbers, and those cubes have a side of 256 uh, elements. And so basically, these are a, a stack of 256 images of, of uh, 256 times 256 resolution. And so we multiply it by coils. Uh, well, I, I, I'm, I'm a bit lost already at this point, but I'm sure you know what, uh, <laughs> what, what I'm talking uh, about. Coil sensitivity maps. Pardon? Coil sensitivity maps. Okay. So we have this image and you have coils around it, and different coils uh, have different uh, sensitivity to points in that image. Oh, okay. So the coil which is on this side will be sensitive to this side of the okay. image but less sensitive to the other side. Oh, okay, okay, thank you. And so and after that we take the the FFT of all the, the resulting slide uh, slices. So the first step is the, the multiplication. So the benchmark is the, the the amount of time it takes with the CPU. So it takes a bit more than five seconds. So QDA, in fact, is extremely efficient because it, it does what the CPU did in more than five seconds. It does it in point, uh, 0.15 seconds. But on top of that, we have to copy data during 19 seconds. So, <laughs> <laughs> so OpenACC does a bit better. Uh, and perhaps it's because I didn't do it well, but we'll talk about a little bit the code uh, ledger. And then OpenMP using the GPU 
also does it a little bit better. It's between the two. But then what beats them all is simply uh, using multi-threading with OpenMP. And so for the FFT, I just compared FFT double view with CU FFT. But then there is less data transfer, so it goes much faster. And then again, what beats them all is to, to, to compute, to take the, the simple FFT uh, with the FFT double view, but of all the slices, the, the slices in parallel simply with, the, with OpenMP. How many threads? 128. Yeah. Yeah, yes, it was on Panther. And, and <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes. It's, uh, <laughs> it's difficult to do. <laughs> well, I didn't do it on purpose. I mean, it's just, it's because it's, it's a machine, in fact, where there, there are GPUs on the login nodes. So even the login node is beefy because it is one terabyte of, of, uh, of RAM and two GPUs and 128 cores. And what's nice is that you, you can do everything on the login node. You don't need, when you just compile your code, you don't need to start booking time. Like which login node was this? Pardon? Which login node was this? What machine? On, on Panther. On oh, Panther, I guess that's from the powers. Pardon? That's for the powers, isn't it? Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, you're Guardian using it too? Hmm? You're using it too? I had an account a long time ago, but it's lapsed. Oh, okay. <laughs> but I do know which I need to. Yeah, okay, they're both good login nodes. If you're using the login node uh, and all the cores, aren't you? You're then competing for CPU time with every other user. Y y y yes, but uh, I mean, to uh, just to compile and to because w w when you're just editing your code and compiling it, then I, I use it on the. Uh, it's the reason why I chose that machine. And then when I would benchmark, I would want to launch a small job. But then I'm mean, actually nice. seeing Naughty doing that. He's not meant to do that. <laughs> A lock in those normally are there for launching, compiling. It's actually you've got a good machine without too many users on it. You may think there's lots of people going through it, yeah. but most people are just pre compiling or doing something else. They're not doing work on it. Yeah, but so anyway. Anyone... It's, a good, it's a, good, a good testing place to put it without telling anybody. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I mean, but they're, they're available. Somebody must do it. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Well, nobody else is going to utilize those notes. In this case, I mean, I was just using the login note just yeah. basically to edit my code and, and compile it because uh, we have another machine for example where there are GPUs but the GPU is, not, is accessible only if you book a compute node so it means right. if you spend half a day editing your code you're going to be uh, half a day doing that. It's what it's there for, it's that you're yes. benchmarking on a log you're meant to just test things out so there's nothing, you're not doing long runs. Uh, oh no no it was a few, few seconds. Place, but, yeah, sure. It's got some ethics. <laughs> sure. oh, yes and, and so now I, I show... So, uh, uh, sorry so Presumably, the I mean the, the speed up here. Actually, we need to add times times, times here on the previous slide. Like that, yes. we, we need to add times here on previous slide because uh, in the previous slide, uh, uh, loading time included, right? He, sure. he is not, right? He, oh yeah, yeah, yes. What's the it, data on the? It's there too. Right? Uh, so no, no, this is including the loading time. Even because uh, it's because this is you don't play with kernels or anything here. It's quite nice. It's simply a, a function provided by, by by Nvidia, and you just call it, and it does everything. It launches the thing. So the, the the copy is included in this. Okay, good. If you go back, then. so CUDA fifty something like eighteen seconds, right? Yeah. So yes. Nineteen. Months. Yes. Okay. You go there. So we add eighteen here, even even though ah yes. So well, the difference over here, I guess, is that the copy would have been done correctly with QFFT. It's quite easy to um, copy memory inefficiently if you do it manually, as with I assume was done with the previous graph. Yes, I suppose. And it's the reason why I, I, I obtained the less good performance than with, uh, the, 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 than with the other frameworks. And, and also here there is less data copy so but basically I, I presume that all, all this is still dominated by the, the data copy and the FFT yeah. itself is efficient. Yeah. yeah there's a lot of profiling things you can do with CUDA to see where you're slowing down but generally you want to try and copy data allow, uh, around as little as possible. I think the rough guideline is you need to do at least four or five floating point operations per floating point number that you copy over for it to be worth copying. But yeah. Yes, I mean it's true that in the past it was such a in the previous example it was so simple that we just copy the data, do something small, and then and then take it back. But even things when I was when I was profiling, for example, even allocating the memory, for example, would take quite a certain time. In fact, 
Yeah, the other thing with CUDA is in order to copy memory quicker, you tend to have to copy from your CPU's RAM to shared memory and then from shared memory to the GPU. And I can't for the life of me tell you why this is quicker than copying directly to the GPU, but it actually is. It's a little silly, but yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, so in CUDA, you can allocate a shared memory vector kind of thing, and you copy from your normal CPU vectors to the shared memory, and then from the shared memory to the GPU, and that's quicker. Can you copy directly to shared you memory? You can copy directly, but it tends to be slower. But when you talk about shared memory, shared memory, you mean the regular shared memory on the CPU? Yeah, it's shared memory on the CPU, except it's, it's sort of special shared memory that CUDA is aware of, and therefore somehow optimizes data transfers between that and the GPU. Okay. Do you think that the directive-based uh, methods like OpenACC or OpenMP will use this trick? Yeah, so there's CUDA 9, which also automatically handles all of this stuff for you. You can allocate a normal C-style array in uh, CUDA 9, and it'll automatically handle copying to and from the GPU for you, which is, which is really nice. It's just not many people have switched over to using CUDA 9 yet, and it's a nightmare to port over code from older CUDA versions. I'm assuming the others would use these tricks. So if we, if we look at the sample of code, so this is not the code uh, of what uh, uh, I've been doing. This is a very simple example to just to illustrate, what, to illustrate what using CUDA uh, means. So here the example is amounts just to, to, to adding uh, two arrays of numbers in, in, into one. So in fact, with CUDA, this is the kernel, and the kernel is simply the, the loop we would expect to do. But then there is the usual trick with CUDA where you have blocks of threads and you loop by, by, by moving, uh, 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 I mean, according to, to, to that block. And the code that, uh, that calls the, 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 the kernel is, is here. Mm -hmm. So first, you have to allocate memory on the CPU, on the, on the GPU. Then you have to copy the memory from the, the well, from the CPU, from the computer to the GPU. Then you have to execute the kernel, and then you specify so the number of blocks and the number of threads per blocks you're going to use. And you use this this usual trick so that if the one is not a multiple of the other, you don't uh, lose one by uh, by, by, by round, rounding it uh, the, the down. And then after you copy again the, the values from uh, the, 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 CPU, the, the, the GPU, and then you, you deallocate it. So it's all this that's, so we see that it's, it can become a bit tedious and uh, it's, 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 it's becoming quite specific and dependent on the hardware. And I suppose that's because it's because of all this that I lost time and that, that I did better than, uh, less well than, than things like OpenACC. It's because behind the curtains, they were, they were doing something better than what I did. Uh, at the very least, you, you should have left uh, allocation aside because you can allocate once and reuse it. Yeah. Even if you have copy every time, but at least allocation is not needed. Yes, it's true. I did everything. Right. Another thing, I, I see you are not using streams. You know how to use streams. What do you mean streams for? Streams, uh, uh, so you don't know. Uh, so yeah, it's, uh, with a GPU, you can have multiple things going on at the same time. And would you tell your GPUs that functions can be interleaved? So pretty much for all of these CUDA calls, you can have an extra object passed into them called a stream. And you can have multiple streams. And, and it ensures that things which are attached to one stream always happen in sequence but you can have multiple streams, so. And you would normally have a thread allocated to each stream. Yeah. Since you have 128 threads, you have, can have 128 streams. Okay. And uh, you see they, they are concurrent. So while well, one stream is like copying from memory, the other stream is doing something else. And that way you, you, what, what you, you load your GPU better. And is there a bottleneck at the level of the bandwidth or do we really gain from it? Uh, well, in my experience, you always get better with streams. Okay. No, I didn't know that. But to be honest, I, I barely knew. It is about streams. I, I, I barely knew anything about GPUs before starting it. And I just used the code I found in tutorials and things like that. And so, yeah, yes, the thing is, really, well, it's this is a little bit like Hello World with GPUs. So it's it's really it's really basic. 
So now if we look at OpenSCC, so the first advantage you'll notice is that since there is much less code, it will strain less your eyes. <laughs> and so it's simply the, the, the loop was simply a, a, a preprocessor directive before and one after. And simply the copy in says uh, allocate that memory on the, the GPU and then copy the memory from the CPU to the GPU. And then that, that directive says allocate that memory on the GPU you and then copy back the data uh, when you're finished and yes what's really nice is that uh, we don't have it's not, we don't we don't have to start uh, creating arrays of doubles and things like that and, and allocating them and copying them and things like that a little bit like like in all C we can put in here a, a, a nice big fancy class for example and it's going to work all the same so this is with open so you use doubles in your test you use doubles. Yes, I used I used doubles. Yes. Oh dear, oh dear, no, no, no. It was on purpose. It was on purpose. Very bad. Because um, uh, in double, uh, with doubles, you cannot do atomic write to the memory. You see, it's uh, oh, uh, it's, it's, it's terrible. So I, I was terrified when I was trying the same example in double. It, how just slow? Just try to get with normal laptop. Of, just try to get and see what happens. Okay. Yeah, you yeah. you float. Yeah, GPUs are always bent for floats. Really. Well, I I I read about about that, but I I decided to use doubles all the same because I, I wanted to be a bit ruthless with it, I, I, and also I I had read that that higher end GPUs uh, could, yes. could handle. They can't handle that. Yes. Power eight. So power eight's not got a good GPU. I can't put it on So you, that's going to just caveat that because the machine you're using may not be as bad as you think. Mm -hmm. It's not at the. Uh, well, it could be. It could be. Um, why, no, it's why worth to do, do, it, do a quick try. Just change it to play it to see how it works. Okay. Yes. Yes. Because exactly. everything is done with templates, so I can uh, I can change my test. Yes. Yeah. Sure. But Philippe. Yes. This uh, Edo here. This uh, OpenACC uh, declaration. Does it make it parallel, or is it just copying the data? It looks like to me. I mean, it's just copying the data on the GPU. Yeah, it seems amazing that you don't have to write a kernel in it and it I think you should to run that on the GPU. I guess there must be restrictions for the source of code which can be in the folder Perhaps that it can actually do it. I might have forgotten a line if I, because this is not the code I've used, of course. Uh, okay. This is a small example yeah. I, I, I've taken after uh, to, to illustrate what it was, but the code I used was back before. And now that you say, not that you say that, I wouldn't exclude that there was a second line uh, uh, a second yeah. directive before the, the yeah, yeah, you'll have an ACC parallel for or something. There, yes. there should be a kernel's uh, declaration. Yeah, yeah, yes, I suppose. And it's just that I forgot it when, when, when I did okay. this one example. But, uh, well, I, I would need to look in my code. But yes, there's probably something like that. And actually, it, for this type of loop, even have to uh, say copy in and copy out in OpenACC. It, it will do it by itself. Just, oh, yeah. I think, in my experience, it was like Pragma ACC kernels that, that's sufficient to, to make it uh, work. And the compiler takes care of everything. And in fact, it might get too uh, inefficient because it's continuously doing uh, allocation in GPU, tra memory transfer. Well, yes, but I mean, this code this did not run. I mean, it's not the one of, of my example. No, 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 sure. It's just. I'm sharing I, what I know. Well, what you're saying now rings a bell. I, I've probably used it in my example. I need to check. It's just that I, small, something small I, I made up so that uh, I could show a little bit the implications. So for multi-threading in the OpenMP, well, it's the, the, the classical stuff. Mm -hmm. And then uh, when we use OpenMP for the GPU, then uh, it's, it's something, a syntax that's a little bit similar. We, we copy to the GPU uh, the number of, of numbers and then the arrays themselves, then we copy them back and then we, we run it. And so the conclusion is that they're really efficient, but... Uh, excuse me, Philippe, again. Th this directive for the OpenMP, will it work on a multi-thread? I tried to mix the two and it crashes, it, it, it crashes systematically so I, I left to 
investigate that, but the, 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 the comments for, for, well, the, the directive for the GPU and for the CPU are different. And I'm not sure if you can mix both. Well, well when I tried, it didn't work. Okay, because I, I know for sure that you can use the same uh, directives in OpenMP, uh, OpenACC to uh, target uh, either multi-thread, so CPU or GPU. So, that but, but I tried to do the same thing to mix the two with Open with OpenACC as well, and it crashed. But again, I, I was lacking time, so I just I just I, I stopped trying to combine the two. That's, that sounds highly non-trivial. Yes. And then I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know if you're going to saturate the GPU or not. Or, and, and I don't know if, if there is something to gain. So, so I, I'd say that uh, what we can say with GPUs is that they can be extremely efficient, but at the same time, the code you're going to write is going to be more complicated. Uh, the, the, you, you have, in, in a way, you have to, I think the only way to, to use it would, re, would be to, to, to find a specific part of of your algorithm and then that is suitable for that and to build the, to, to build it around the GPU and then to take advantage of it because otherwise it complicates everything and there is the price to pay in terms of, uh, of copy of, uh, of data. Because there is a, a small thing I wanted to, to, to show. Yes, it was this. So, oh. So, one, one too many. Uh, uh, where were we? The last one. Uh, no, the one on the right, yeah. Yes, it's because in the example that I've shown, uh, the, the, it, it was simple because we have a simple operation with independent simple operations on, on, distinct, on, on distinct elements of, 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 of the arrays. But if you want to do something more complicated, like for example, sum all the elements of the arrays, it can, it can become really complicated to do it well. And that is an example I found, I just wanted to, to, to show that. So it's a document of 38 pages about basically summing an array of of oh, 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 oh. and they have seven methods of increasing complexity and it looks a bit terrifying and I was wondering do we really want to go into this <laughs> so yeah with, with CUDA it's, it's easy to start coding but to, to achieve a re, to get real performance uh, well you you have to go through all that yeah yes Yeah, so if you can call CUDA FFT, you're happy because they've done all the hard work. Also, um, well, I'm not familiar with CUDA FFT, but I'm pretty much familiar with CUDA Glass, and with CUDA Glass, you, you, you don't copy it. CUDA Glass wouldn't copy the data. From yeah, yeah, yes, yes, CUDA FFT is the same thing. You just call a function and it does everything. It, well, but my, my impression was you said copying from CPU was included. CUFFT, yes, but, but what I mean is that uh, you don't have to do it by hand, so you call a, f a function. Yeah, 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 I, I know, but uh, with CU Glass, uh, you have alternative. The pointer could be on device, or pointer could, could be on, on GPU. You probably use the version where uh, you use pointer on, on CPU. That's why it copied. If you copy it first and then use uh, pointers on, on device, well, the copying time wouldn't be included. Shouldn't be. Okay. Also, I hope you do not forget to synchronize. But you will. Oh dear. <laughs> well, I didn't know anything about <laughs> GPU, so I... No, it's, all your timing is wrong. You have to synchronize. Because I... <laughs> when, you, when you start with the kernel, when you start with the kernel, it starts to work immediately uh, uh, without waiting. Uh, in the meantime, your computer can do something else. So you have to issue CUDA device synchronize, and only after that you measure time. Okay. Always the CUDA device synchronize when you want to measure time. Okay, you know that. Otherwise, well, you may think you have spend a lot of time allocating. No, no you, you spend a lot of time doing something else. Well, it's the profiler that, that was saying. So ah, profiler, right, yeah, profiler, if you use profiler, that's a bit different. Yeah, profiler may do it. Because it's what, struck, it's what struck me when I was looking at the profiling is that a significant chunk of the, the, the time was spent simply allocating memory, and I was surprised it was yeah. taking so much time. So maybe profiler is not good. Yeah. 
I would suggest you do manually divide synchronize and measure time by C functions. Okay. That would be more. So, well, this Edo here. I, I want to work for you today. <laughs> This is this this really gives you a, a good good uh, idea of how complex things can go in in with CUDA, for instance, if you, if you go that way, because uh, you need to be aware of millions of things, and uh, yeah, it starts to be very 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 hard with specific, and then and I didn't understand, Casper, you you said porting code from CUDA eight to CUDA nine, it's a nightmare. Did you say so? Uh, well, not necessarily a nightmare. It's just um, basically a, you, you can delete a whole bunch of code and make things look a lot neater. It's just annoying having to do this. Basically, every time CUDA updates, well, NVIDIA updates CUDA, yes, it becomes nicer and greater and more wonderful and quicker, but you have to keep changing your code. Yeah, you so. To make use of the latest features and the latest GPUs. So Chris is uh, going away from GPUs. <laughs> sure. it's, it's why I've been away from GPUs for uh, uh, 15 years now. <laughs> what it does mean is that, I think the two things to take from this is what it means that before you actually get integrated, it's nothing wrong with doing it, is doing the, do these trials, sure. and then do these trials also, i said the next stage, on real, on real test, the real test data, sure. not just the trying to mimic. Because I think once you apply different sizes of data from the real test data, you may find parameters change. Yeah, that's uh, true. A two, five, six cubed image is kind of uh, suspicious. <laughs> could be, quite well could, could they use more um, for MR? Uh, I it's quite... No, if you have any MR people... Uh, any MR... Yeah, yeah, just try yeah, things out. <laughs> yeah. No, but yeah, I mean, powers of two are obviously quite good for effectiveness. What, what I found it very uh, interesting in OpenACC was, uh, when I tried it, that you could use the same uh, pragma line so, uh, to, to a, a target a GPU or a CPU, multi-threading CPU. So, I mean, at the end, you're writing C codes, and then you say, I want to parallelize this, and then, if you don't think you have, have a GPU, you can use it. You can compile it for a CPU, and it works exactly like uh, OpenMP, basically. Maybe it's a little better in, it looks better to me. But you have to tell it some, some information on your host uh, and target. So how do you do that then? At compilation time, you, t you say, so uh, OpenACC, I think it targets only NVIDIA GPUs, right? And you, you say what uh, compute capabilities you have on the machine, and then it will create a binary. Right. Um, yeah, I, I know a little bit about the OpenMP uh, GPU support, and I know more about CPU support. But, um, open HTC, I briefly looked at the, uh, I, I thought one of the problems with Open HTC is compiler support, but maybe that's moved on in the meantime. So. I think GCC, I think from six point something, uh, supports Open HTC. I'm not sure exactly if version two or 2.5. Uh, it's a bit cumbersome because you have to create this LLVM byproduct in the meantime, in the middle, and then get your binary somehow. I, I didn't do it. I used the PGI compiler, which was good. Yeah, yeah, might uh, might be useful. But I think that's true for any of these things. Is that if you do limit yourself to specific compilers and, and whatever one that's going to create some more trouble, but okay. All right. Um, for, for, for OpenMP4, Philippe, did you use GCC7? Uh, I think so, yes. 
I can check, but uh, well, I need to, to move on several machines, but yes, I think so. So it could be interesting to try OpenACC. Oh, OpenACC you compiled with GCC as well. Oh. I think so. I, I, well, I, in total, I played with uh, with NVCC, with PGI, and with uh, and, 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 and with and, and with uh, GC, and with G plus plus. So I, I don't remember exactly which one was which which, but I think so. Yes. Yeah. I, I would need to look in the make files I've used. So it, it, I, I suppose in. I mean, this this is obviously a never-ending job, but uh, I think in your benchmarking compiler versions and, and architecture and whatever is going to be very important to specify as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah yes, sure. Uh, yeah, okay. I mean, this gives people some better understanding, I think, of, of the challenges involved. Uh, so I don't think we should be going much more much more on this right now aside from, so what i suggest that we try and do with the limited information that we have we have a, a, a bit of a discussion time scheduled on uh, where as opposed to maybe how do we add gpu support in in all the software that we're having and I thought it might be something that uh, if any can be because he has uh, played around with GPU and multi-threading and GPU and, uh, and, and give you some, some leaks there that for people to discuss. So the, in particular, the issue is do we add GPU support in SIR? Do we do it in STIR? There is some in Gadgetron. There is some in Nifty Ridge. And how do we get all that stuff talking to each other is sort of the, the challenge, I suppose. Uh, on to, so, uh, in, in surf, uh, on the pet side, we, we don't do any substantial job. Everything is delegated to stir. On the mass side, I had to do forward and backward project, projection. Uh, well, as far as porting to GPU is concerned. So on that side, we only need to have extra type of, uh, to, to derive uh, another image acquisition data object, which will be GPU objects. We already have, um, um, well, SURF is designed to handle um, several uh, storage schemes. We have two storage schemes at present, it's CPU memory and file. So it would be no problem to add GPU memory, no problem with server. All problems are on, on the engine side. Uh, save for, as I said, on the Mars side, uh, we do uh, front and backup project projection in surf, but it's, it's very trivial to, to, to do on GPU. It's a ridiculous part of the activation. And after we're, made all, all the amendments, uh, I'm sure we will be, uh, we'll be uh, CPU. Yeah. Uh, the can, can I first ask, so uh, we had to put the acquisition, MR acquisition model data inside SURF uh, because there was no Gadgetron gadget that we could call to, to do that operation for us. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. There yeah. Are no gadgets. And so you took code from I forget either ISMR or I suppose the ISMRM code and, and sort of converted that into search. Yeah, more or less. Yeah. yeah. So. Um, I'm guessing Gadgetron has GPU versions of the Fourier transform sensor or all the yeah, there. Yeah, sure, for the that's for sure. I saw them. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. they have Gadgetron memory and so on as well. So, is there is there a way we could avoid having our own FFT and put some of that 
somewhere else. But they ask Edgetron to expose their things, modify their GPU code, whatever, or FFT code, things like that. So. Yeah, if we could uh, get hold of, of their forward battery projection, they must have somewhere. Yeah. Then we would need our own, and, and it's it is the only place we need a fast way transform nowhere else. So that that could be the way forward. Yeah. So then we will solve this FFT problem once and for all. Yeah. Uh, one thing though, uh, with uh, Gadgetron, uh, I believe there's no way you can avoid copying to. Uh, to, CP, to the GPU because Gadgetron expects um, uh, um, ISMRD data on, on input and ISMRD data is CPU data. It, it doesn't allow GPU storage. So we would have uh, data on client side on our a surf would have it in, on CPU to, in order to, we'll have to have it on CPU in order to be, to communicate it to server, to, GPU, to Gadgetron. And get it back out again, again on, on the CPU. That's unavoidable. It's just sort of cost 19 seconds. But uh, I, I still think that uh, it's not a big deal uh, because, well, last time I checked, uh, you could exchange data with the GPU at a rate of eight gigabyte per second. Um, so if you do it properly, so, uh, and. It, it wouldn't be our responsibility, it would be Gadgetron's responsibility. Sure. Anyway, on top of, if a big big data will live in files anyway, and so it will be sent to Gadgetron from file. And uh, I'm sure that the file exchange is slower than exchange All right, so everything is uh, more or less okay on, uh, Gadgetron side, because Gadgetron. Okay, a quick question, I think, following on, on that. Um, if you wrapped from ISM, uh, or you stole the code from ISM RMRD, um, could you also wrap the code from there and then have a Gadgetron reconstructor and a ISM RMRD reconstructor? Uh, I cannot have Gadgetron on Windows. Uh, we, we still haven't succeeded, um, so I cannot work with Gadgetron directly. Gadgetron mm -hmm. uh, on, on my machine. But the ISM RMRD, I mean. Uh, ISM RMRD, okay, I, I can install it. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a very simple package. Uh, so on, on my computers, um, Gadgetron uh, sits in virtual machine mm -hmm. and uh, surf sits on, on, on Windows and sends data to virtual yeah. machine. But if, if you've got the FFT, I'm assuming it's a reconstructor in ISMRM ID, can you wrap that and have that as a reconstructor into SIR? So you can have so a gadget. I, I've lost it already, so it's, start again, please. So you've got in SIRF the Gadgetron reconstruction, but then- It's, it's not in SIRF, it's, it's, it's separate from SIRF. No, yeah, but you've got a wrapper for the Gadgetron. No, I don't. What, oh, Gadgetron we, runs, we Gadgetron, uh, I just run Gadgetron on a virtual machine, mm -hmm. totally independently from surf. Yeah. It just sits and waits for, for input from port 9002. Mm -hmm. So whatever is sent to port 9002 will, will be processed by Gadgetron. But, but ignoring... On my side, uh, I know nothing about Gadgetron. Mm -hmm. I have uh, data in ISMM RD format. Yeah. Acquisition data. So I send that acquisition data to virtual machine mm -hmm. and, and wait for image data to arrive back. Yeah. But, but my question, I suppose, doesn't really matter on the Gadgetron. It's more so if ISMRMID has um, a Fourier transform, does that mean it does also? No, no it doesn't have Fourier transforms. Oh, I thought yeah. we were saying. Well, it, yeah, but, but it, it does for, for the purpose of uh, creating phantom. Okay. They create a Chef Logan Phantom and they then simulate acquisition data. Mm -hmm. But it's not it's, it's there though. that they need FFT. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, the, the, if, not, if not for that, we, I would need FFT. So it's, not, it's not part of the library, it's in one of the example uh, scripts that they have. Yeah, this. yeah, and uh, where they generate Chef Logan, uh, they yep. call FFT. Mm -hmm. Just to simulate. Okay, okay, but it's not like an efficient implementation or anything. It's not usable to just wrap it. 
well, it, it uses F50W, I mean, that, that mm. much I know. It's, mm. it's, a, it's a prerequisite, apparently, for a while. So now. Mm. Uh, oh, which, which is a problem, actually. So we cannot completely get rid of it. Well, so, I mean, one of the, I don't know what the underlying FFT code on the gadget drone is, but I'm guessing it's also FFTW, I mean, more than likely. So, if Philip comes up with the most wonderful FFT package, uh, we might uh, talk, talk to the gadget drone people and say, why don't you give us the, or build in the option to replace FFTW calls with Philip's version, and then and we, uh, we solve the version of the license issue that way as well. Well, then also for ISMRM ID and get yeah, it. Yeah, sure, yeah, sure. Uh, but so, yeah, I, I think it would be nice for us, I believe, to be able to rely on Gadgetron to do things very fast and very smart, and they have all this farming out over clouds and got my shot uh, with their gadgets. So if we would be able to call an acquisition model type of gadget yeah. in the yeah. gadgets, then that would make your life a lot easier. Sure, yeah, sure. Because I'm, I'm I'm worried about well, I, I did my best to. to to do this forward projection, but did I do it correctly? Yeah. <laughs> it's just my guess. Sure. In fact, we, we have this uh, demo with a steepest descent, if you remember. I do a oh. um, um, sample, under sampling. Uh, under sam I, I do under sample reconstruction. Uh, there's some noise and I apply steepest descent step and the noise disappeared. Yeah, but uh, that's for Shep Logan thinking but when I, I did it on a real thing uh, well that step would introduce noise right? <laughs> <laughs> meaning that my forward projection is not yeah. right what, what they do in the gadget room right that's why right also what worries me I noticed that um, XML files from which I uh, I learned about gadget and gadgets and I implemented them and serve they now disappeared. They now have different external files for even for full for, for sample construction. And I wonder, uh, probably I, I, I should uh, update my gadget library as well because they may go out of existence. Yeah, that's something to check with them. Is it, Edo here, is it not an option to create a, a gadgets? ourselves as part of surf? Uh, yes, we can do that, um, but then how we, do, how we distribute them? Yeah, it becomes quite complicated. I, I think the preferred option would be to possibly write our own gadgets, but then contribute them to gadgets from and hope that they accept them. Yeah, by a pull request. Yeah, because otherwise we get into distribution nightmares. Yes. I mean, it seems to my... Uh, so we do contribute to stir uh, because it needs, you know, we need some, sometimes it doesn't exist. Uh, maybe it's a good idea to use Gadgetron, but also make it better. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. Um, yeah, ideal situation would be if we had somebody, somebody like Chris from Gadgetron team, <laughs> and then we could do a lot. But that, it's why Johannes unfortunately left. But so he was saying, okay, I took some stuff from the Gadgetron for quite the different sampling scheme using the non-uniform FFTs and, and all of that stuff, and, uh, which we can't right now. So they, the people in Berlin understand this better. And mm -hmm. obviously we need it, uh, them to help us and I from what I recall also guy who talked last time Thomas Kustner from King's he had extra gadgets to be similar to acquisition models I think or mm -hmm. uh, so and he seemed to be willing for further discussions so yeah, I think we need to pick that up with him 
probably first. Now he, he tried to contribute to Gadstrom, but it hasn't worked, but that's maybe because he tried to do too much in a way. Uh, need to do something isolated, small, that, that maybe makes them happy. Uh, right, so suppose, suppose we can do that, then we can say, okay, uh, our FFT code and for the MR side will be handled by Gadgetron and maybe we help them to do it better. Uh, so the, we, I guess we're more or less saying we don't need to explicitly have GPU support in surf aside from possibly the container. Yeah, only only as a pointer. Allocation, yeah, we can do allocation on GPU. And that's it. The rest should be handled by yeah. So a question then if we if we write a synergistic uh, oh, no, 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 no. That's what I'm saying. No, no. Well, well with the MAR, as, as I said, we have to have it on CPU yeah, because sure. we only can send right. Sure. And we, we we still haven't discussed stir side okay. uh, where the bottleneck is for forward and backward projection. Sure. And coding that in GPU is a one hell of a job. Yep. But by the way, what, what, whatever happened to Pavel? He was doing something. Uh, yeah, so um, Pavel, does anybody know if Nifty, whatever pet, is open source now? No, or not. Uh, so uh, we need to find out from him. So he has GPU code. Uh, projectors which uh, uh, are specific to MMR and he's put some in, some things in for the signal, but uh, no time of flight. Um, and I I would imagine that being able to, in a simplistic way, call it where internally the projector would copy stuff to his format and then call it and then come back is not a very hard job. Uh, so there's uh, another option which I very briefly discussed with uh, with Martin Casper. Uh, you you guys have GPU code for four projections as well. So no, Andrew is still online. Yeah, forward and back projections. Yeah, for the Siemens MMO scanner. Yeah. So the, there's an, an alternative over there that maybe we could potentially get the contribution from to stir. Mm -hmm. uh, because yeah, implementing that is a huge job. Uh, I think be... Sure, I think it's the main thing is settling on the API and how to actually do this. Right. So uh, I know Pavel's stuff is all CUDA. Uh, I don't know what's. Uh, are you guys your CUDA as well, Kings? Um, yeah, CUDA and then MATLAB wrappers on top of it. Right. Um, so it, in, in, some, in some sense, the question of which framework to use might be stolen from us in the sense that if there, if there are certain things that get contributed that use a particular library or, uh, or framework, then I suppose that's what we are. Mm -hmm. uh, what we're going to have to do. Um, I, yeah, I think um, the question is it, for all of this, how deep do we go? Um, uh, if, if you don't mind, I'll try and put the discussion on the synergistic front. So suppose we we rely on gadgets from to do really fast uh, whatever MR stuff and the same thing on the stir side. But now we want to get those to talk to each other, uh, which after all is what this project is about. So if you want to do something synergistically by, I think it's necessary that images are able to talk to each other in some sense. So you want to say, let me filter my pet image based on some MR information with boundaries, or let me construct kernels from MR that then I apply to pets or or whatever. 
so is there any chance in hell that uh, we can do all of that on wonderful GPU type of memory things uh, or not at all? Well, I would have thought images are not that big. We can have all them on CPU no problem. Or, or, or else drop them on GPU when needed. Again, as I said, eight gigabytes per sec. Yeah. It shouldn't be a problem. It's whether with acquisition data is different, but acquisition data are totally different for my yeah, sure. then, then, then I don't expect any synergy there. No. But, but to have an idea what kind of performance bottlenecks do you have? I mean, uh, for example, when you, when, you have, when you acquire data, how long does it take to process it? Is it unworkable or do you take one day for, uh, to have, to have, once you've taken a measurement during half an hour or? Uh, it, it will vastly depend on what we are doing, but uh, the, our, our main bottleneck sits on the stir side on the pet reconstruction. You can easily do spend half an hour or an hour reconstruction. Of something that took the same time to measure. Yeah, probably. I mean, or 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 a three minute acquisition. It might be spending half an hour reconstructing. Well, we do not use 128 threads. <laughs> well, yeah, we don't have a pattern or anything. That's I why in your, in your future tests, please use uh, reduce the number of threads. Yeah, you can, you can, you can do it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, and if we if we go towards saying, well, we have we have dynamic data, which is which is working on, and you want to build in motion correction, and so as, as opposed to doing one of those, you you are talking about the data for that for constructing that data. Roughly, I would say. Yeah. So uh, a factor. A factor 20 or something like that would be nice. Okay. <laughs> but at the same time, these are not exactly untractable, like bioinformatics, for example, something like that, where you can have terabytes of data. And, and if you don't do it with a, in a distributed way, it's going to take days or months. Or, or... Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, so sort of it's halfway. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but so. I mean, the, the, the question, does SURF need to know at all about GPU and storage and all of that stuff? But because we could say, whenever you call gadgets from, it's already the case, or STIR, it takes care of transfers to GPU stuff and so on internally. Yeah, it could be yeah. done. After all, uh, on, on STIR, uh, the, well, the amount of time for a projection takes is should be far larger than yeah. transfer of data. Yeah, should be. And as I said, with, uh, on Gadgetron, we even do not have any choice. Yeah, because if we if we put in a lot of effort to be able to have handles and containers that where the memory is stored yeah. on the GPU and all of that, uh, but actually we can't use it for the synergistic reconstruction anyway. Then we sort of uh, also remember uh, that the user can only get data through as array and uh, thing here, uh, uh, as a numpy array as it, it, and it's CPU. Yeah. Uh, I don't think we should go for something like pile up or right. Well, that sounds to me like a sensible first target then to, yeah, sure. to try and keep the GPU side completely in the mm -hmm. engine and, and translate everything to GPU before it goes mm -hmm. to serve. And then if it becomes a bottleneck, then we will think again. Right. Right. Okay. Um, so, Richard, do you, do you know the Lifty Wretch? I think is CUDA as well, yes. Fairly sure. Yeah. 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 Uh, because obviously we, yeah, we, 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 if we say we really like to use array fire for store or something like that, with all the other bits of code use CUDA, then maybe that was not a point. <laughs> because then you need to have array fire and events and so on. Um, that's something which I don't quite understand. If you, 
if you have one of those libraries, Sue, that you discussed at the beginning, sort of uh, the, the things that make try and make CUDA programming or, or multi-threaded programming easier and more portable. Uh, I, I guess my question is, we have two or three different bits of software that might be using different libraries or whatever to talk to a GPU. Is that going to be a problem? I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. I would have thought so, but I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Um, because uh, I guess okay, th th there is two ways. The sim most simple way of doing all of this, I suppose, is to say, I do a call from Sir. I do a call to nifty stir whatever which then sets up the gpu it does the calculation it comes it puts everything in cpu memory it closes down its gpu connections and whatever and you go back to the serve site and then now you do a gadget from call and it it does the same thing uh, that seems to be easy but most likely slow well, I think that would be the first step, and then after that, we might look into calling functions which already expect GPU arrays. Right. Yeah, that's just going to say how many APIs actually expose a function that takes yeah. arguments, GPU objects. Right. Yeah. All. Yeah, many. Yeah, the only. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure, but uh, at Casper, so the King site, you say you have MATLAB wrappers. I, I know you have GPU arrays in MATLAB and you have similar. Yeah. Things. No, we, the, the stuff we do is, is ridiculously basic. I mean, I say we have MATLAB wrappers. I haven't got around to actually looking into them, but I think what we do most of the time is actually save things to disk and then copy it around. It's just horrible. <laughs> 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 I've resorted to using shared memory disks just to make that quicker, but it's still hard. <laughs> I can't be bothered to look through the code. I didn't write it. <laughs> Very efficient. Yeah. <laughs> but basically, uh, uh, we have the same problems. We use uh, software, which is called Astra for projections in, in, in CT, so X rays. And uh, they do things in, in GPU, but not sure how I would, I, I need to look into their code and ask them, but if I would want to do some operations on the arrays, and GPU arrays that they use, I, they need to provide me a pointer, which is not so trivial. I don't know how many of these libraries would do that, you know? Mm. Okay. I think most of the time you are, you're doing, doing something which is very quick on GPU, but then you have to transfer the memory. Right. <laughs> or save to disk. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Good. So I, I think those, those are some nice uh, decisions uh, being made here that we say uh, we try and isolate any GPUs support in the underlying packages in the engines and uh, we try and do that such that serve actually doesn't really need to know if the underlying package is running is on GPU or not except for maybe saying well I need to call this version of the or projection or, or whatever or that particular gadget which has a GPU name as opposed to CPU but otherwise uh, that would be the only only bits that uh, that, that surf knows, uh, which then also brings us a little bit to a uh, stir project on adding GPU support to stir, and ideally by stealing code from somebody else. Uh, yeah. And also, we'll have less trouble installing surf. Yeah. 
we do not ask for GPU. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Good. Uh, shall we go into deployment options? Because yeah, we are ten minutes left. Ten minutes left is not. Uh, I don't think Casper can talk very fast, but maybe not. That. Um, yeah, sure. Um, I guess I'll have to share screens. Uh, okay, let me first pop over here. Mirror display, supply. Keep. Um, how do I share screens? Share screen. Uh, all of my desktops are the same. That's fine. Right. Do you see one screen? Hopefully, just one screen. Yes. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Great. Cool. Uh, full screen. So yeah, um, quick recap of GPU stuff: um, how hardware and software is kind of linked together, and sort of shoeboxes you. Uh, difference between desktops and um, clusters and maybe whatever this weird cloud thing is, whatever that means, um, and how Docker can help you and NVIDIA's wrappers for Docker can also help us. Um, so with plain CPU code, there's things like OpenCL, OpenMP. Uh, Intel's come up with this thing called threaded building blocks, which is kind of nice. Um, one's better than the other, really. OpenMP, I find, is nice because it's minimal amount of additional code needed, really, to make things multi-threaded. Uh, OpenCL2 tends to be kind of clunky, but at least it's open source. Um, and NVIDIA has this thing called CUDA, which is a superset of C++. Um, it's tied to NVIDIA pretty much, but at least it's, it's, I find it nicer to program in. It's still annoying and clunky, but nicer than OpenCL for now, at least. Um, since CUDA's also been around for longer with scientifically useful functions, it's, it's more popular. Uh, you tend to see it around a lot more than things like uh, OpenCL. At least I do. Um, and realistically, it's about 15 to 65% faster than uh, OpenCL, depending on how, how much you spend optimizing. OK, so focusing on CUDA, uh, firstly, yes, you need an NVIDIA GPU, a supported operating system, and a graphics driver. If you have an NVIDIA GPU, you probably have the first three already. Uh, though you do need to install the CUDA toolkit, which is all of the C++ libraries and the NVIDIA CUDA compiler, so NVCC. Uh, which is pretty much a wrapper around GCC. That's what you can think of it as. Since CUDA is a superset of C++, uh, and VCC is kind of a, a wrapper and superset of GCC, you can give it plain C++ code, and it will compile it. It will probably just give it to GCC. Um, but you can add CUDA syntax and things, and we'll compile and run that for the GPU. So, uh, uh, yeah, go ahead. I, I see you don't have any Mac listed there. <laughs> Um, yeah, sure. Mac also works. Um, I left it out. Unix style stuff. Mac is definitely Unix, right? Right? Yeah, no, it, it works. I know people use Kuno and Mac. Are, are they? I'm, I'm, it was what I was going to ask because yeah. uh, I sort of believe Ben at some point told me that it can be done. But, uh, what can be done? Could I? On, on Mac, yeah. Yeah, can be. Okay. They, I think recently they in the last couple of years, they've not really used NVIDIA GPUs. But I had a Mac that did have an NVIDIA GPU and I had CUDA on. Right. Yeah, it's possible. I, it's it's annoying, but possible, as far as I know. I didn't find it annoying at all. It's just like okay. a double Fair Okay. Good. Yeah. Nice. Um, mind you, uh, it used to be annoying to install in Linux as well, but eh, hopefully getting better. OK, so if you're trying to target multiple GPUs going towards some clusters and things like that, there's low-level primitives to select what device you're currently using. Uh, you can copy memory between devices. Um, by default, that always goes through the CPU RAM, but you can enable it to directly copy between devices, um, which is quite nice. And then there's further wrapping of all of that. CUDA 9 is the latest sort of release version. 10 is in beta right now, uh, which wraps this up further into things called cooperative groups, where you can, you know, group together threads into warps, warps into blocks and grids, and then you can have multi-GPU grids, um, which is nice, but still clunky programming. Then there's further wrapping of this into things like the collective communications library, which provides these nice convenience functions like all gather, all reduce, um, quite nice and easy to call from C++. Again, they automatically handle your memory copy transfers for you and can also do things like networking, so you can have networked GPUs all working together. 
uh, which is all nice. And then you have yet another level of wrapping on top of all of this. Sorry, sorry, I'm going. Yeah, go ahead. So your previous one. Uh, yeah. So I see they're multi-threaded. So are you saying that uh, and CCL and CUDA and whatever can do multi-threaded applications on CPU as well? Yeah, so basically the, the whole thing about having multiple streams and multiple threads and each GPU is handled by a different CPU process which also has uh, multi-threading going on. Yeah, um, from what I understand it, it can handle all of this without you having to write too much extra code. All right. Um, yeah, personally I've never used NCCL, but I've used the other stuff. Okay, um, yeah, so there's even higher level wrappers of all of this, things like Python and MATLAB, uh, TensorFlow and all these all this is really to say that there's there's many, many levels of wrapping, and it's not so much an onion skin as a sort of a really tall skyscraper. If you upgrade a floor in between, everything will probably crash and burn. Um, so controlling versions tends to be really important to make sure you, you have exactly something which works. And, and um, Docker can help with this. So basically, Docker is, uh, you can think of it as a replacement for virtual machines, which is inaccurate, but a useful analogy. Um, so it's a container-based type kind of thing where you hope to have basically zero overhead. It should be nearly instantaneous to create and destroy machines. So you can use them as disposable things if you want. Um, in theory, it's as, if you have Docker already installed, it's, it's just two lines of code to pull down all of service dependencies, um, build everything, and uh, you get a nice sort of um, container called Surf. Okay, so the nice thing with Linux is every single hardware device you have on your computer, whether it's a keyboard, a mouse, a actual graphics card, all gets mounted as a file system device to the slash dev folder. Um, what that means is if you want your container to have access to your GPU, you just need to share the appropriate file system device, which is a nice little trick, which NVIDIA is wrapped up into um, what it calls NVIDIA Docker. So a little visualization of what that is. You have a physical server with some GPUs. You have basic host operating system and CUDA driver on top of that. You don't need to install the CUDA toolkit, just, just Docker. And then that is your sort of reusable stack. It's the first thing I installed in any new machine. And on top of that, you can have containers which run completely different operating systems, different versions of CUDA toolkits, different applications. They can run simultaneously, talk to each other over networking. Um, tends to be quite nice and reusable. So this, this base stack with the Docker engine can be provided by cloud providers and then you can have your own custom images running surf on top of that, for example. OK, so um, looking at clouds, um, there's this thing called the NVIDIA GPU cloud, which is completely inaccurately named since it's not actually a cloud. It's just a repository of commonly used containers. So if I go back, um, quite often people will use specifically CUDA toolkit version 9 and Python with TensorFlow or something up here. So they've provided a contain uh, repository of pre-built images for you to use, so minimal setup. Um, really, just on top of that, you should just be able to see make uh, surf and, and be good to go. Um, you can pull that for your own local machines or just run it directly on, on Amazon uh, Web Services or something like that. So there's, there's two major cloud providers up there, which is Google Cloud. Uh, they were the first offer per second building, so they, they used to be cheaper. There's currently a competitive war on basically between Google and uh, Amazon P, P2 and P3 instances, which are the GPU instances. Um, everything's fully customizable. It tends to be cheaper than running your own um, hardware. Uh, so explicitly going through an ex example of um, deployment on, say, your own local Ubuntu machine um, versus Docker. So firstly, you do need to install the CUDA drivers. Um, on top of that, you need the development libraries. I've specified 9.0 since things like TensorFlow need that. Um, by default, it will install 9.2 if you don't specify that. Um, you might need extra libraries on top of that, which don't ship with the CUDA toolkit, such as uh, deep neural networks, NCCL, that sort of thing. And um, yes, you have issues with possibly conflicts, version conflicts. Anyway, um, these are the two lines of code which you should need to actually install uh, CUDA drivers on the Linux machine, and they are guaranteed to work and never fail, right? Anyone who knows this will know that's a birthday slide. Um, CUDA Toolkit, um, this is copied directly from the CUDA website, how to install that. And for comparison, if you're using Docker, you still unfortunately do need the CUDA drivers, but then it's just installed Docker and NVIDIA's wrapper. And 
after that, you can pull and download and create your own images and machines and use it to your heart's content. Um, so that's how you install Docker. That's how you install NVIDIA Docker. And that's how you would, for example, run a specific machine containing CUDA Toolkit 9, certain versions of other things. And um, yeah. They Lots both, of there. both Lights are available. very, very threatening. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> You said make it quick, right? Sure. Anyway, I think Ben also has some slides as well, which um, I can. Yeah. Present. Hang on, hang on. Let's uh, stop for a okay. second. Uh, <laughs> cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, we need to recover. <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, good idea. Um, so, okay. Where do you want to start? <laughs> where Where do we want to start? Um, I guess you're you're okay. If we deploy, uh, if people have Linux systems with GPU, or they have some cloud account with GPU or whatever. Yeah. You're saying doing something like this with Docker is by far the simplest way to uh, avoid having to think about versions and all that. We make one Docker image that has it all on there and everything yeah. will work, more or less what you're saying. Yeah. So there's the initial setup overhead of installing Kuna drivers and Docker, but after that, it's very easy to completely change things around and use completely different versions and you don't have to worry about having multiple versions of CUDA toolkit installed sitting side by side and all that sort of thing. Yeah, and uh, how does that then know about the specific GPU and whatever? So that's the whole point. It doesn't know about all of that. So your, your um, NVIDIA Docker wrapper, which sits on top of um, your host operating system, handles all of that for you. So. Um, you can still write pretty much your generic CUDA code. It's a standard thing with CUDA code that you might have to specify block sizes and grid sizes. Most mm -hmm. people just assume something like 1,024 threads or 2,048 threads. Um, that's a little GPU specific. You could handle that with hash defines or something, but it's I, I consider that sort of nitty gritty fine detail which doesn't matter too much in most cases. Okay, so you you sort of say you you make the Docker image for one particular block size, and maybe you make two Docker images for different sets of blocks. Sure. Sizes. Yeah, it's most people don't bother with this, and and they'll just release a Docker image assuming that you have a reasonably recent CUDA GPU, not something which is really old, but it won't be fully optimized for the most bleeding edge GPUs. Um, that's just CUDA programming in general. It's not really a Docker issue. It's something we would have problems with even if we didn't have Docker. So, Casper, um, so now we can install Surf on, on the doc, with the Docker container, right? So, so have yeah. yeah, so we provide a container which already has Docker installed. Right. Uh, so, it, so if we want to say we have a machine which has a GPU, we, we just need this other layer in between. Uh, so after <laughs> Docker, so you need Docker then the NVIDIA Docker thingy, and then you can okay. install our so software. So NVIDIA, uh, you, uh, where is it? Overview. Um, NVIDIA Docker is just a wrapper for Docker, really, to make sure that you, uh, so normally you would just do Docker run, and whatever image name you had, whether it's called CCF, Edema, Surf, or whatever. Um, the only difference, if you wanted to have access to your GPU, is you have this extra flag, really. Um, and NVIDIA Docker will ensure that your GPU gets mounted in your container. So how, how much does this actually depend on you, people using the, the Docker thing using CUDA uh, or whatever? I mean, is it not just talking to the GPU directly, the device, which 
Yeah, so that's why you need the GPU driver installed with nothing else. So it does directly talk to you GPUs. Uh, so uh, hypothetically, we would be using a open ACC or OpenCL. Got no sure, you could you could use pretty much anything. Yeah. Well, that's quite nice. Yeah. yeah. I would personally abandon the virtual machine, although <laughs> certainly it's really good. But I remember we've, we've had this discussion last time we had a meeting when Chris wasn't present, where we all decided to uh, abandon it. <laughs> yeah, I'll, show you. I, I'll point you to our user survey. <laughs> That's the... Who cares? Who needs users when you have developers, right? <laughs> So yeah, I think, well, okay. One is the users, the other one is MATLAB. Yeah, so I'll just stop there, I suppose. <laughs> um, right, okay, so I think I would, that was relevant, but nevertheless quite useful. Uh, uh -huh. Yeah. So you have still have, are people still okay to spend another 15 minutes here? Or, uh, yeah. They should be kind. Uh, you're free to go, obviously. Uh, yeah. Some slides from Ben. Some slides from Ben, haven't really spoken about them, but um, we can flick through them, I guess, together. So yeah, there's Microsoft Azure, or Azure, or however you pronounce that, as well as a provider. Um, I think that's what we used for the um, previous workshops and things. Um, so there's this thing called Packer, which is a wrapper over Vagrant files. For those of you who haven't used Vagrant files before, they're sort of uh, a specification of how to create a virtual machine, so you can version control these things. Um, Packer will wrap that further to make it easier for you to deploy to uh, cloud, basically. Uh, I think I slightly correct that. My understanding is that it's sadly a tool from the same company, but with uh, almost the same syntax. Oh, okay, fair enough. So cool. it doesn't wrap the other one, you, but you, you have to create a new Packer file, which is the equivalent of the Vagrant. Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. Oh, I, I, I thought it wrapped. Oh, that's even better. Awesome. Great. Okay, so but you can deploy it to different cloud providers. Yeah, in one file. Yeah, <laughs> um, and and again, we're we're tending towards calling things images rather than virtual machines or whatever, because um, we're I think the world is going to be forced to use Docker eventually. So it's it's coming very slowly. Anyway, um, so that's what a, a pipeline sort of looks like. Um, this is the point where you would have to think about. Uh, surf specific things coming in. Um, so CMake and things, uh, whatever dependencies you need. And up here is when you actually have your pre-built machine, which you can then save and upload to the website or whatever for other people to download. So they won't have to do all of this stuff in between. They just start an Ubuntu machine in the cloud, go directly to downloading this pre-built image, and can do whatever they want. Um, so this is kind of what already happens with our continuous integration in a way. Um, we do have a Travis machine up in the cloud somewhere, which will clone and build everything whenever we push a new permit and uh, check that the tests run. Um, cool. So yeah, that's what the web interface looks like. There's your Packer image, which lives next to all of your other images in uh, the Azure interface. This is the really small neat command line, which you need in order to build things. Very memorable. Um, and the nice thing about doing things in the cloud is that you get a publicly accessible IP address. So you could run Jupyter notebooks and things like that. Again, we've used this in the past. Um, you can directly SSH into containers if you want to. This is not Azure specific. But yep, useful stuff. Um, pros is that it's, it's really low cost. You don't have to worry about upgrading your own physical hardware. The really annoying thing, which I find, is this last bullet point, um, which is the uh, storage costs, really. So if you have, say, a really high-end machine running in the cloud, whether you're Google Cloud or Amazon, say you've got eight of the latest generation GPUs and three dozen cores and a modest 250 gigabytes SSD, uh, that'll cost about $40, $45 per hour to run. Half of that cost alone would be for the 250 gigabyte SSD. So having fast, persistent, local storage tends to be pretty expensive for these things. Um, if you're willing to make do with network-attached 
uh, slow storage, which might be in a completely different continent that, of course, is cheap, but otherwise it's, it's annoying that the storage costs are a thing. Yeah, and I think that's pretty much it. Yeah, so I think it's sort of saying if you, if you want to be in simulation land uh, where you, you or want to experiment the different reconstructions of the same data, this is all uh, very cost effective if you want to say, no, I'm going to pipe all the data from my scanner onto the cloud and reconstruct it there, then it's going to become expensive. Yeah. You probably don't want to be doing many network transfers. Uh, the other thing with the cloud is that you can get uh, theoretically up to 90% discount um, if you're willing to have your machine uh, preemptible. And what that means is that if Google decides that they're running out of computational resources, they will kill your machine without notifying you. And, and it will restart maybe after a few minutes. Um, so if you're careful about how you write your code that it's OK to do that, then you can you can basically get really heavy savings from that as well. These pros and cons are, are for Microsoft Azure. Uh, they apply to any of the cloud providers. It's not just Azure. I did have an interesting aside. I was given from the comment thing was because Azure, which came to me and gave, gave me yet more free time for my for the PhD students. And a few of them came back and said they had enough free time. They only get about a, about a week's good test systems, five per day or two is running, a few days running, and then it runs out, and then they can't then have the credit card. So um, you definitely can get, get free time. And the other one is to say that I know there's meant to be a consortium put together across Janet or just Janet to try to buy cloud provision cheaply for academics. Oh, really? So it's doing that. And I know that we're in, we're in Leeds and the N8 universities have decided to put some money into that. Admittedly, I think they're still umming and ahhing at the top vice chances how much money that may be or whether it will actually go in. But they, instead of just having pure HPC hardware, people are starting to say, let's put a, you know, series of 100,000, 200,000, 400,000 pounds to numbers right. for academics in the cloud. This, I don't know how much that equates to time and how quickly they get used up. Sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, okay. Good. Uh, so I guess uh, Chris, just a little comment. We as CCPs, there is some time allocated on Archer, which is the national supercomputer here in in the UK, which we don't use too much, as, uh, as far as I understand. So, well, we as all CCPs, not all CCPs, so in case of need of uh, you know big computation, um, whatever we. We could think of also that. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I, in some sense, I don't think our the CCP effort in itself is huge computational. Uh, it's software development and building time and so on. But to, then to be able to to run some decent sized experiments is quite uh, come in handy. Although then we have to learn about Archer. I'm sure Archer doesn't do Docker. <laughs> Who knows? Who knows? JDIS, GPU cluster, um, so the tier two ones are. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, I think we, we've run out of time, unfortunately. Um, sorry. I think the wrong uh, mouse here again. Um, I, I hope this. This was useful. We at least made some decisions on the GPU side. We didn't really go as far as making decisions on deployment and so on goes. But uh, my understanding from Casper's presentation is that we, if we do whatever could have whatever development on Ubuntu, and we we can then dockerify it without really any a lot of trouble. Yeah. So that, In a way, so we kind of already have this running. We already right. do Docker images on Travis. It's right. just install NVIDIA Docker on top of that, really. Yeah, so that's uh, that's quite good news. So that's definitely worth uh, yeah. noting in the in the minutes there. Um, and I presume something similar will be on the cloud as well. It's uh, it's just 
our supporting of multiple platforms, once we throw GPU in the mix, is going to just uh, get worse and worse. Okay, uh, I, I think I'll just end then with uh, a last slide on, on future meetings, maybe. Uh, Oh well, where's the back again? Rid of, I'm sorry. Right. Okay, we uh, stop this sharing. I share from my other laptop, so it's very confusing. So uh, future meetings, well, we have the reconstruction course uh, on the 12th of November for people who want to trek to Australia. Uh, we're, uh, the current plan is to use SPUR, they're not yet SURF and hope, hopefully we can get SURF into MIC next year. Um, but we would be using the, uh, the cloud system as well, like in the PSMR course, which just work just as well for STIR as for SERP, obviously. Uh, we have a STIR users meeting there where I will put, uh, or we should put uh, SERP uh, progress on the agenda as well, just to let people where we're going there. Um, then, obviously, we need to have our next uh, software meeting because of the MIC stuff. We sort of are six weekly, but uh, we'll have to extend it a little bit. Um, I'm guessing our next uh, venue would be Manchester if we roll it around, but Julian is not here. So any, uh, we should probably do a doodle or so to find a date for that. Uh, but I suggested after 26th of November that we all recovered from jet lag. <laughs> And then we have our two weekly software developers meeting. So for the next software meeting, what do we think is a, a good chunk of topics? I thought the what we discussed earlier of uh, how to think about different engines and how do we talk to them, how do we have ITK or Nifty Reg or whatever, I think that might, might be a good one. Yeah. Uh, aside from the usual progress uh, updates and stuff. Uh, yeah, I forgot to put that on here. Uh, 15 or 16 October, we'll have a presentation from Simon Stutt from uh, Paris uh, of C to talk about Castor, which is a pet reconstruction uh, open source package, which also does GPU and all of that stuff. And uh, to then see how could we integrate that potentially to serve, they are interested in helping us out with that. So you say 15th or 16th? 15 or 16, I've asked for uh, people opinions so if it would, would be most convenient. What month was it? December. October. Uh, so it will depend on the room book. So we'll, we'll try and sort it out tomorrow. Uh, so that would then lead us to the next software meeting. Uh, have, have some idea of another software package for pet reconstruction, which then how do we create an interface between those uh, at least in principle you know. so a sizable topic because of the benefits uh, the uh, corresponding the apps which will be presented they may see when we have have some time to contribute into that yeah we did if you wish uh, and uh, yeah, so, yeah, we, yeah we, we actually haven't presented any of Richard's work on that uh, today. If there was no time, would that be good? Uh, yeah, let's do a separate uh, update. Sorry, were you talking specifically about mining? Yeah. Okay. Uh, what was your question then? 
I didn't quite hear that. Uh, it's quite likely that, you know, compression of time, we may not have enough time to provide feedback. And uh, also in the abstract, it was not enough time to provide enough time feedback. And then we feel, some people may feel they, they don't ah, contribute, sure. although they may want to contribute more. Yeah, of course. Uh, giving them a little bit of notes. Sure. Uh, yeah, otherwise we'll meet it. Okay. Uh, great. Well, thank you, uh, especially to Sue and Philip, and especially to Philip for trekking all the way to this. <laughs> but it's uh, an effort. Uh, so let's let's I mean keep in touch, and we whenever you have some more results on benchmarking and I guess if Kenny will uh, want to talk to you about uh, oh, GPU. Okay, okay we carry on. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, let's close the meeting then. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. See you. Bye.